No one, no one knows, no one, no one knows We all woke up in an upside down Turning inside out like we've all been led astray We've been standing on the outside in Trying to find our friends like we're all just cast away Feel like we Hi there all, welcome back to Ricky Leaks and Ascension Diaries and Jenny Constantine's channel. Hello all, and we are on the final installment of Harry Potter in Real Life series. Welcome back, Alexis and Jenny. Hi girls. Hi. Thanks for having us back. Oh, thank you for doing this with me. I don't know who else I could just call and say, do you want to talk about Harry Potter for 10 hours straight? <laughs> you girls. Did me a good one. It's solid. <laughs> always be here for it. Thank Although we were just saying we're gonna <laughs> wait, we're gonna take a Harry Potter break for about a year. I'm like I'm never watching Harry Potter for a year. Oh my god! We got new stuff coming out. Apparently, they're making a series. Yeah, so they're um, making a series. Um, that'll be really interesting. I think it's gonna be hard for a lot of people to see someone else play the kids and everything but um there was as we talked and went over each thing there's just a lot that wasn't included with harry potter in because they had to fit really big books into an hour and a half or two hours so i'm excited to see different takes of how they go with it now but um really what we covered is still going to be good for any new renditions it's still going to be the same storyline and um it's i if anything they might make it more woke like they ruin every new series they make so we might be talking about like the pure harry that we all grew up with for the last time kind of thing so <sighs> all right let's get started on, on this seventh slide share screen year seven what a year what a year we lost a lot of characters <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <I'm dead. laughs> so it's sad been a long road you guys it's been a long can you guys see my screen oh yes i can okay cool 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 so again we're not endorsing any way, one way of thinking. We're not endorsing any idols or any one religion. We are simply covering fiction in real life in pertaining to Harry Potter. And we look at all of these stories without fear because we got God on our side. And um, what for the last time of this series, we are going to put on the whole armor of God. We are going to put on the helmet, wait, <laughs> helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth. God's gospel are going to be shrouding our feet. Hold the shield of faith and grab that sword of the spirit. Um, a great way to get rid of any yucky energies uh, is going to be cleaning. I have said this every time. There are very real giant spiders and they do act as uh, surveillance beings. And uh, if you clean your house, that ruins their little astral webs that they very much have. So a lot of people feel better just moving 20 or 30 items in a room. You'll you'll see what a difference it does. Yeah, tossing around all those little hiding spots. Exactly, exactly. Corners. Uh, a true wizard doesn't really like corners in architecture because those little hiding spots get full of just a bunch of nasty debris. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have already covered Gryffindor and Hufflepuff and Slytherin, and this episode is going to be Ravenclaw's big one. Yay! I love Ravenclaw. Yes, it's going to be air elements. There's a lot of air aerial fighting in this one. There's a lot of... Um, the kids in your seventh year of Hogwarts, you learn how to... I never say the word right. When you... Like portal in and out of a place, you uh, evaporate or it's like evaporate. It's yeah, 
I'll put the right word in post-production, <laughs> but that is traveling through the airwaves um, immediately in the, in the movies, they show this as like black smoke traveling through the air, but it's really just an immediate trans um, transmission of a hum of a wizard from one area to another. And you basically learn how to do this on your seventh year. So the kids did learn how to do this. A lot of the um, traveling the children do is going be to be literally traveling through the air. So Ravenclaw, even though we hear Raven in the name, it's actually their, um, their animal is a eagle. So it's going to be of the air and a gaseous substance. And also these people are going to be, we all know of them as very intelligent or smart, but really they're eccentric and curious and their curiosity yeah is what brings them the intelligence because they have so many questions that they need to know the answer. So obviously through curiosity, um, they gain a lot of intel, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're smarter than like anyone else, because obviously like Hermione's the smartest witch of her age, but she's obviously a um, Gryffindor. So it doesn't necessarily mean smart, but curious is always going to be people who have the most intel. And astronomers too. They have the astronomy edge. Oh, good. We're going to be talking a lot about astronomy, which of course is going to be our heavens. So that totally makes sense. Right. And there's in these the scenes, there's a lot more open spaces and they're larger, like the larger scenes. They have much bigger, they run around in bigger courtyards and That's bigger rooms. True. And and it I makes know. you feel so small because yeah. this whole seventh book is about being removed from the wizarding world because the kids are alone the kids go into hiding um there is a fake news propaganda even though everyone knows Voldemort is back some people and I think this book is hard to relate I mean it's too easy to relate and it's hard to talk about because it's really what many of us truthers have gone through since 2020 um People think you're crazy for believing conspiracies, even though it's truth. And um, even when the truth does come to light, people ultimately in the wizarding world have to make a decision. Okay, do I fight for the truth that I know there is? Or do I just bend over for Voldemort because I don't want him to kill me? And this is really what we've oh. been seeing for the past 20 or four years, at least. Yes. So Rowena, Rowena Ravenclaw, she said to basically teach the smarties, teach the ones that are curious, teach the ones who ask. So she's big on if you ask, you'll never know. If you'll know, you'll never need to ask. And you'll know only need to ask. And that's how she explains for us to find this room of requirement, which we saw in the fifth Harry Potter book with the Order of the Phoenix and the kid militia was learning how to fight against the Dark Lords. Um, so if you ever kind of go on to Masonic websites or if people slide into your DMs, they're really big into just ask me. I have all the answers. Just ask me. And that is actually part of the Masonic um, orders is you will only be told something if you ask. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in the second Harry Potter book, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, Dumbledore told the kids like uh, Hogwarts will always be there to help you if you, all you need to do is ask for help. Mm -hmm. And this is the biggest problem I have problems with in Awakening and through this journey is sometimes we all kind of get full of ourselves and we all think we have it together. And I think especially in the day and age of social media, we all try to uh, show people that we have it all together. And in doing that, we really do hurt ourselves sometimes because sometimes we do need to ask for a friend's help or guidance um, without having the fear of if we're going to be led astray, I, I personally think. Okay, so uh, teach the Smarties. Help will always be given at Hogwarts for those who ask for it. If you, yeah, so this is person pretty much what we're asking, uh, what we just covered. And the biggest fight at the end of this, which we'll get into um, later, is going to be the final battle against good versus evil is at Hogwarts. It's at the school, and this is just ridiculous because 
in real life, what we're dealing with right now are these schools trying to take over our child's um, innocence, really. They're putting uh, critical race theory in the schools. They're pushing transgenderism in the schools. Uh, a lot of the political parties right now are trying to fight for parental rights, which is just ridiculous that we even have to call it that because it's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're my kids. Like, what the heck? I have a girlfriend and my husband and I, like, we wanted to have kids and we talked about it seven years ago now. Um, and we were like, oh, well, after the war, we'll have kids, which was easy to say when we were like 25 and now we're 33 and we're like, oh, like <laughs> that time has come and gone um, to maybe have kids easily because now it'd be like a geriatric pregnancy and it's not very easy. But I talked to my girlfriend's parents or like my girlfriends who have kids, they're constantly fighting with their schools and they're going to like Christian schools. And then I have kids like everyone's constantly fighting with the schools. Um, so this is a very real thing that we have to deal with is they yeah. do come for the children. That is what this whole war is about. That is where the final battle of this Harry Potter war is. It's for the children. It goes to the school level. Do you guys have anything to say about that? <clears throat> well, when it comes to the, the need to ask is mm -hmm. interesting because I've heard it in other contexts, not just that particular group, but mm -hmm. I wonder why I heard it from other places where it originated, you know, and where it came from, but the free will aspect of things and needing to be able to ask for more information once you've given about a little bit, like if you're not curious, you won't ask for more. And if you are, you will, so you can carry on that. I would say mm, cognitive shift because you can go into cognitive dissonance if you're not ready. But if you are, then you you embrace the cognitive shift and expansion in that moment and engage. I would say like the library of that information through that person. But it's like that gesture of being polite and kind even to other people's path to offer them that initial little bit and then you know you want to know more so i'm curious how so yeah, no you brought up on. a perfect point because yes i call them the masons but really it's any group that knows the kabbalah and who understands the um testament of solomon which is going to be so many different groups in the gnostic and occult communities um i this whole series has been about how there are good wizards and how there are bad wizards and how they all have to learn the same basic stuff and it doesn't right. make the information itself wrong me and jenny if you haven't already seen it we did a three-part series on the nine principles of hermetics um if you were interested in this series i highly suggest you check out uh the series that we did um almost a year ago or something where we cover basically how to utilize a creative skill and magic and these uh lost arts that many different groups utilize not just one um so yeah if i say masons i okay. really do mean all gnostics that kind of look at the kabbalah interesting uh okay so this is a seventh book um i'll call it the seventh movie we're not really breaking it into two parts the reason obviously that hollywood broke it into two parts was to make more money um but it is in it is the final completion year the children do not return to hogwarts that's like a really big thing to understand um they are going to be on the run basically and they don't return to hogwarts for school but they do for the battle of hogwarts because they need to get <laughs> a couple things um that are at the school but i if you guys could help me speak on numerology and the importance of um, seven. I know in the Bible, and I do have some stuff with that, the number seven itself is a very, very interesting number. Um, we have seven days of the week. Um, we have a fullness, a completion in the number seven. Do you guys have something to say on this? You can go ahead. Okay, I'm well, the, I do know that the seven-pointed star has been coming up, but there's also a whole other depth to an eight pointed star and the eight pointed system as well that I've been researching. So each one, each one of these shapes or each one of these like points of the star or whatever seem to kind of, I would say lean into kind of like a f understanding of like our fractal universe. So each layer 
has a different there's has a different quality but they are all included in each other anyway so it's not that far out but i do know that seven is supposed to be a rather magical number and a little controversial i would say we were in a seven year i believe it was last year if you add up two two three like 2023 yes. so we're in an eight year now so we're in a different structure so maybe that's why we're doing this video and we're like we're preparing for the structure of eight now and the eight pointed star is like the buddhic wheel i learned and that's kind of maybe that kind of direction you can go with understanding the lore and their spiritual practice Maybe this year is more in that direction versus seven, which I think is in more Christianity sometimes. And um, that's all I got on the seven. <laughs> and I always uh, want to tell people it's not just Christianity when we're talking about at least the first testament, um, what True. Jew, the Jewish culture calls the Talmud. We right. call the uh, Old Testament, basically. And that's where the book of Revelation and all the seven seals of the end days are going to be seen. Um, the seven trumpets, the seven churches. And then I was just talking on my telegram about, I, I always joke and I can tell someone's full of shit if they know, like if they try and tell you, oh, I know where Atlantis is. And then they tell you like one location on earth because Atlantis and the story of Atlantis is it's seven islands that were the Disney version of Atlantis uh, that were covered by a dome in order to escape a flood. And um, it's interesting that we do have seven continents here and we'll go more into that kind of thinking in a little bit, but uh, yeah, the seven nation army. So uh, in tarot, seven is the chariot. And I just wanted to like pull up like the most generic yes. um, sort of, you know, like what people typically associate the chariot with is war, triumph, vengeance, trouble, reversed its riot, quarreling, disputes, litigation, and defeat. And I just thought that's really funny. Like, you know, because the chariot's actually a really awesome card, but it's when something is like, it's like a turning point. And numerologically speaking, sevens are very, it's a fulcrum point. So it can tip backwards or it can mm -hmm. tip forward. And so when we say, lucky number seven luck is not i mean we got good luck and we have bad luck yes. so last year was essentially like a swing year like last year was that fulcrum point and then whatever was like crystallized in that time that's what we're working with in 2024 so um but yeah seven is a good number the cherry is a good card and uh i personally my favorite was when the kids didn't go back to Hogwarts. I loved it because it felt to me like, okay, they're, they're big kids now. Like this is not, this isn't first year, you know, this isn't, we're not at platform nine and three quarters anymore. They're like in the woods. Yeah. They're like literally being hunted by gang members. Like mm -hmm. when uh, that one musty dusty guy could smell Hermione's perfume. I was yeah. like, we are in it. Like they're getting run down by like cartel members. <laughs> yeah, it's it's bad. It's um, it's a dirty, it's a dirty movie, and like it's so funny because I have a very close friend who was, I met her about seven years ago. Which ironically, let's see what was happening seven years ago. Seven years and twenty five days ago was January twentieth, two thousand seventeen, when Donald Trump went into office. Oh my gosh. Uh huh. We are seven years after that right now. Um, the seven year <laughs> war, the chariot victory. It's it's go time. This is Holy this is God. it basically. Seven so, years now. What the where did the time go? Oh I know God. it's ridiculous. Oh my God. So, um, yeah, like it's, we're at a completion year with, uh, whatever his mission was seven years ago. And we all have to remember that when Donald Trump went into office immediately, like the first thing he did was he made January the month of human trafficking awareness. That was his first number one thing on the agenda. And with this Harry Potter, the storyline, what we're going through, you see the ministry change it goes into a different minister's hands uh there they, you definitely see minister aides and people that work with the ministry 
at the table in the movie with Voldemort. Um, and it's like, yeah, we they Voldemort jokes about, yeah, we're in the ministry. And then if you go into the ministry, which we do see a couple scenes where the kids have to go into the ministry under um, the guise of looking like other people with polyjuice potion, you see this huge um, sta st statue of humans, muggles being crushed and holding up basically the ministry is saying that they're going to enslave the muggles last year the ministry did go into parliament so we have a full world takeover we're not just talking about the wizardry world anymore we're talking about everyone and um this underlying enslavement of muggles which is going to be human trafficking is coming up and then on top of that the muggles that go to the hogwarts school they're being hunted when um jenny brought up those cartel members they're looking for muggles and muggleborns and something they don't show in the movies is a lot of the times when they're out in the wilderness hiding dean thomas one of their little friends from school he is a muggle born, so he's on the run too. So they do like on the run meet into they bump into their other Hogwarts friends. Um, and obviously Luna, Dean Thomas were picked up by Voldemort, just like how Harry and Hermione um get picked up by him at the end of the seventh movie, um, the bit in the middle of the seventh book. And yeah, like it is everyone, they're hunting humans, it is human trafficking ultimately. Three, six, nine weeks to the week since the inauguration, the first time. Oh my gosh. <gasps> There's something cool about that just because of the Tesla thing and, you know, Trump's uncle and all that stuff. <laughs> just some, yeah, yeah. This is what, 61,000 hours ago? Jeez Louise. 61,000 <laughs> hours ago. This is crazy. That time. Yeah, it's yeah. been. 369 weeks. 61,000 hours. 222 million seconds ago. What the? What? Like, come on. Stop. Like, I can't even, like... That's ridiculous. Oh, it's been such a long time. I cannot even mm -hmm. imagine myself... Like, and that's another thing I always wanted to bring up, and it doesn't really have to do so much about, um, like... Harry Potter as much as just like what we're dealing with, I guess is if there's this huge fight, like if you have to fight the good fight, if you're going to be, if prophecy is going to tell you like, you have to do this thing in your life, this mission, people don't want to hear how hard it's going to be. Obviously, like you have to kind of be tricked <laughs> into doing the good fight. Um, yeah, it's true. You really you know do. What? And I totally get it. And on my channel, I have a story time where I had this crazy dream. I had just gotten married with my husband and I wasn't very awake. And I had this dream where I saw zombies being woken up and this huge event happened and there was worldwide news that shook the world and I was like this thing is gonna happen but God source spirit doesn't tell you how it's gonna happen and if we knew how it was gonna happen or if we knew how long it was going to take many people aren't going to do it and looking back here now we're like okay, it's been 222 million seconds or minutes or whatever. Like, okay, I wouldn't have done it if you would have told yourself seven years ago, like, oh, you're going to lose all of your friends. Your family's not going to talk to you. You're going to get all of your rights taken away. Are you still going to do it? No, no, not. no. So that's what we see with the kids. Um, they're not babies anymore. They're 17 years old, which for the UK, that's an adult. 17 is like you're on your own. You get to make your own decisions from here on out, good or bad or whatever. Um, let me get rid of that. And take you back to the main screen that I'm seeing. So... We are, <laughs> I'm sorry. 
this was interesting and I did want to talk about it really quickly because we do have the four houses and the four houses are teaching the children. Um, the four houses to me do remind me a little bit of, because Hogwarts is there. Remember we have to, we remember that Hogwarts is almost this own self thinking machine and people don't realize that the sorting hat, it has its own consciousness. The four founders of the school made the sorting hat kind of rep, uh, understand what each child was capable of doing and which one of their houses were going to teach that child. That's why we have the sorting hat. And in the beginning of the year, it's not Dumbledore or McGonagall that like picks these kids. It's the sorting hat. So the sorting hat even knows if you have a squib, which is kind of a child that was born from a magical family, but they don't have any magical powers. The sorting hat knows who that kid is and they're not going to be able to go to the school basically. Um, but that sorting hat is kind of the consciousness of the school. If you ask me, and it is a little bit of each of one of the founding fathers, um, and ultimately, like I said, this is all ending up in the battle of Hogwarts. It's the, it is the fight against pure Satan himself, basically at the end of the road. But Hogwarts has this beautiful mechanism that's never been used. I don't think up until this point where it protects the kids. Like McGonagall is like, I've always wanted to use this charm. And she knows how to activate the ultimate protection of Hogwarts and it is raising up this dome um, that does keep the bad guys at bay for at least a good amount of time and it does take a lot of hits so that's wonderful to see but I know in protection spells that we deal with you kind of have this north south east and west um, grid is a very, very basic grid for protection. And in the Bible, actually seven, <laughs> Daniel chapter seven does introduce the idea of the four winds and the four winds um, in, in the Bible explain the winds of God and it's the winds of spirit. And if anyone has, um, you know, 30 to an hour, there are wonderful sermons online that explain the four winds of heaven. And it's just really interesting to see the correlation between the different spirit of God giving you protection. And again, all you have to do is ask for it. All you have to do is know that it's there. And a lot of biblical texts and magic goes into faith. Do you have faith that it will protect you? Do you have do you know that it's going to work because ultimately most of our life is just a mind game. That's why everyone always goes, "Oh, oh it's a psyop. Get over the word psyop. Everything yeah. in the world is a psyop. Waking up in the morning with an alarm is a psychological operation. You wouldn't do it if something wasn't telling you to do it. Um, <laughs> paying your taxes is a psychological operation. If you've ever gone to the store and you see your receipt and it says you pay 10 cents in taxes. Yeah, that's a psychological operation. Uh, it's purely out of fear. If you don't pay your taxes, um, that is how they are basically creating modern day slaves. So when people say, oh my God, that's a, something is a psyop, get over it. Literally everything is because it's, they're basically asking you like, are you going to think something's going to happen or not? Do you have faith? And um, the four wins kind of goes into just knowing that whatever your outcome you want to happen is going to happen. And of course, I'm always going to tell people like, put your faith in God, but it's also, you could just put faith in your own um, plan. If you make a plan and you know, it's going to follow through, then so be it. It will just because you have faith that it will. Okay. So we went over seven. This is the seventh book. It's the seventh year at Hogwarts. And there are seven Horcruxes that this entire book, this entire ser uh, series goes down to finding the Horcruxes that Voldemort made over the past 50 years. And we have to destroy them before we ultimately kill Voldemort. Look at cute Nagini in the middle. I know, isn't he adorable? <laughs> She's like, hi guys. Hi guys. 
What's up? Um, we always joke about Nagini being cute and stuff because Nagini is one of the Horcruxes that um, Voldemort made, but she ultimately wasn't originally bad. Again, this she's goes a person. Over. She's a she's a person. She was, she was a, witch. a woman. She, she was <laughs> not bad at all. And then, of course, he. Um, made her into this form and it was really really sad and she's been with him for 50 years so of course he has corrupted her and a lot of people don't understand why i talk about parasites so much and it's like parasites yes it could be the intestinal tract or the blood parasites which i do want people to get rid of but you really have to realize that parasites happen in government parasites happen in electricity we always have these parasitic powers that try to get something good and cipher energy from it. So I know throughout this awakening, you're going to hear different things like, well, technically the Masons or the Templars weren't bad originally, but it doesn't matter. They were parasite. They were made into parasites um, and people have made something good into something bad because that is what ultimately happens with corruption. And that is what, we're trying to show here were the kids being wizards bad no but if you allow a reptilian overlord to start um running loose with his crazy notions of pure bloods and this race hatred then yeah you are going to end up with corrupted versions of maybe something that was once good um Really quick, the type of Horcruxes, I should just pull it up. We had, we've already ruined the journal, the diary that Voldemort kept when he was a kid at school. We saw that be ruined in the second Harry Potter book. Um, we have Harry was an accidental Horcrux. Um, and in order to make a Horcrux, you have to kill somebody. And then a little part of you is transferred into in this case harry or an object and if you die the idea of a horcrux is you can go to that object or someone else can and revive you and that's where we got into um the osiris and how these elites kind of utilize resurrection and how it really does have to be sacrifice of another soul to save your soul. Um, there was a locket, there was a goblet, there was a sword of Gryffindor, and there was a, was it a rock? Let's see. Where's the tiara? Thank you. Diadem. Diadem. You're like hunt and destroy and there's like a baby on there. <laughs> It's so, I'm like, is that a parasite? Are you trying? Is that the parasite also? Like, what are you getting at? That's so funny. No, it's Harry. He's an accidental. And we learned in the sixth book, I believe, that we're going to put on the baby. Um, we learned in the sixth book that Harry knows he's going to have to die, either him or, or Voldemort, or a part of him is going to have to die in order to kill Voldemort, but he doesn't know like how that's going to go about. Um, so that's really interesting because you kind of think that like Harry's walking to his death this entire time. It's a very dark. He does too. He thinks like he's, that's wild. That's like crazy for anybody, let alone a 17 year old kid. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm ready to die. It's like you poor little thing. You like, it's crazy. sad. He's, crazy. he's a kid. We're probably going to get to it, but my, I think maybe like the best scene, I've said that like five times, but when Harry and uh, Dumbledore meet at the train station, which is in his mind, yes, probably the most like, to me, like the hardest hitting scene in the whole thing. Um, wonderful. Really like, nice. I, we're probably really getting there. So I didn't really make a slide for that. So we will definitely bring that up at the very end. Um, it is a brilliant scene. And um, it really, that in itself is a crossroads moment. That is Harry's ultimate yeah. crossroad because it, and Dumbledore even says that at the time. Right. Dumbledore says, you, he's like, am I dead? He's like, you can choose to be. Do you want to die? Or do you want to go back? Like, it's up to you. So, mm -hmm. and the reason it's at King's Cross Station is because King, we associate the train station as are you coming or going are you going this way this way are you going to get on the train it literally is a crossroads and uh dumbledore explains that to harry in this ether 
moment um, when he does kill Voldemort. And it's wonderful. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, so the devil and imitators and his imitators, because that's another thing people don't realize. There's a lot of demons who try to pretend they are the ultimate devil to make us even fear them more, even if they're just like a pathetic, wimpy, little tiny demon that's like easy to kill. The demon doesn't want us to know that. So they make it seem like they're the ultimate like Satan. So I say the devil and his imitators are a liar. They're going to try and influence you to choose the scary or the wrong outcome based on fear. Um, it's safe to say that everything is a 90% truth. So do not take the devil's bait. Oh, I spelled bait wrong. <laughs> and confuse God for religion. That's probably the biggest thing that the devil has hindered about our faith and everything is you start to talk about the the bible and some of these ancient stories and people go oh my god well religion i'm not talking about religion i'm talking about god i'm talking about the oldest fictional book that has ever been mass produced and that's the bible don't get that confused for religion religion is made by men um and it's men's word and that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. So the path of God or truth or Jesus will be the safest route on the journey. And I always want people to know that even though it is blanketed in corruption, it's been corrupted so much because it does hold probably the safest path. But the good news about that is... I truly believe that God is going to smite the religions first before anything else. So it's kind of like, I think we're going to see the Vatican fall. And that is like all roads lead to Rome for a very specific reason. And I do think that these religions that lied are going to be the first to fall. And uh, the people that were obviously mistaken with some of these thinking modalities are going to be protected ultimately as long as they didn't do anything bad to babies <laughs> <laughs> right hands off the children yeah um let's observe oh so yeah we're gonna always look at other paths and i wanted to talk about this ultimate example of the crossroads because so many of us are familiar with like, like all origin stories and one of we always kind of are told, is the globe round or flat? But what that really ultimately means, I'm not talking about the shape of the earth. I'm talking about origin stories. And that's why I keep going back to the flat earth uh, psyop. And there are things about flat earth that they have documented so well, mainly uh, the biblical stance of what the Bible says our world looks like. And it's like, okay, there's a dome, there's a firmament, there's the heavenly waters above. And they explain that very beautifully. And of course, the flat earth people stole those ideas for themselves. But there are many different ways that those same exact truths and proofs are utilized in different origin stories that have nothing to do with flatness. Thank so, you for bringing that up because, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that no, is please. Massive because I'm like you. Um, I believe very like deeply there is a firmament. Mm -hmm. There is some kind of membrane. I don't even if, know if we could call it a firmament. There's some kind of membrane, and we know that we know that there are waters above and waters below. We know that we you know, but the idea that those uh, traits, those characteristics are like exclusive to the flat earth model. That's a lie. It's, that is a, that is a flat, it's a flat out lie. So, you know, we don't have to merge those things together. They can be different. And, um, it is annoying, right? Cause then you have people that are pretty, you know, they're quite knowledgeable about, uh, the, the, uh, texts, but yes. they subscribe to the flat earth model. And, and it's like, they're so adamant about it. And it's like, can you not like, look, look, there's so many other ways to interpret it. Um, there really, really are. And of course, if you start bringing up these truths, everyone's like, oh, that's flat earth. No, it's not. There's many different ways this can happen. And we saw it in two, the, the, the two biggest stories outside of Harry Potter that I wanted to look at for this was Hunger Games. In the second Hunger, well, in both Hunger Games, it's a matrix that is meant to kill the kids. And it's just killing kids for entertainment. And um, it is just a platform that is a hologram. 
and it is covered by a dome and there are fake <laughs> AI programs that are very real. They could really hurt you or really kill you. Yes. But it is ultimately a flat matrix covered by a dome. And in the second Hunger Games, wait, the third? Second. At the end of the second Hunger Games, you see Katniss um, utilize the power of the lightning bolt and she shatters the firmament and she escapes the game that was killing ch children and then their real underground warfare starts um so that's one way where a lot of people do think we're in a matrix and it's like no we're not really in a 2d or a flat earth realm but it is kind of like a 2d code making this illusion of whatever we're on and then my favorite i know everyone hates disney but disney does have to tell us truths like that's why <laughs> they are what they are. Yeah. And the idea of Atlantis, remember, I keep explaining Atlantis is seven islands that were doing really, really bad things. They were doing child trafficking. They were eating children. There was cannibalism <laughs> alongside all this very high technology. And the wizards of this high technology, they got bad. They were horrible and they were flushed out by a deluge or a flood and in the disney version of atlantis you see to escape the flood a dome was placed over atlantis to hopefully save it and um thousands of years have gone by since this dome was placed over atlantis to the point that when researchers go down to find Atlantis, the mythical lost city, the lost islands, they realize, oh, they forgot who they are. The Atlantinians, they forgot their Atlantis. They forgot how to use magic. They don't know what these crystals are, but they're everywhere. So even them, it's just been so long that they forgot they were Atlantis. All seven continents, I mean, <laughs> islands of Atlantis are the lost civilization um so a lot of people always go i know where atlantis is it's in the south pacific it's in blah 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 it's in no you guys it's everywhere because i'm pretty sure <laughs> we're dealing with that same exact map and in the bible it says back to the times of noah everything's going to go down when we're back to the times of noah so noah was getting rid of atlantis they were getting rid of human trafficking and cannibalism and human genome hybrids and all the stuff that we're seeing um, with Epstein Island, basically. So that is kind of where I wanted to go with my, there are different meanings of what the heavenly waters above us could mean. And it's not just flat earth, but whenever you're given only two options, like Republican, Democrat, Terrain theory, germ theory, they're both bullshit. Those are two traps, two wings of the same bird. Two, they are both um, the lies that we want to be staying away from um, because they're the most talked about. So I wanted to cover like... Your first two choices are going to be lo low-level choices. Both of these groups say stupid things like the globe is round. Duh. The globe is flat. Duh. Every single Q post is real. Duh. Every single Q post is fake. Duh. Most lazy people stop here and they are the ones who speak ignorance the loudest. And if you keep going down the, the path, you'll see other choices that look a lot like these two proofs, but they go much more into detail. So when you keep going, you'll see choice three. We're, a lot of people think we're still on a vessel or a ship or Noah's Ark even, and that we're in a dream. Um, and we are on the ship that was taken over by like organic matter. And um, we are on a spaceship being harvested for energy or, oh no, we're on a turtle, duh. And you hear a lot of these different ideas of what our world is. And that kind of goes into different origin stories. And the turtle theory. I, I would gladly live on the back of a turtle. I know. I'm like, I would be so happy if we're on a turtle, first of all. And that does kind of go into um, the ultimate. They all go in together. They all make sense together, which is what's funny. 
but uh, the yeah. Noah's part, the Noah and the Ark part is still biblical. We would just realize that we're living on a different part of the story and the different part of the timeline than we think we're on. And that's like what I think is the worst thing about the Bible is everyone assumes we're at a certain point of the Bible, but like, we don't know. We don't know where we are in the story. So we might still be on Noah's Ark. We might still, the rapture might have happened during World War II when 40,000 million people went missing. Like there's so many different things that we don't know where we are. So like, you can't just put your faith into what the religions say we are as far as the Bible goes in that timeline. There's so much to think about. It's literally, it's like, oh my God. So how much. many people? I mean, I get yeah, people went missing, people go missing. Totally. That's a lot of people. Yeah. And then there's people that say, did those people go missing or was that a lie? There's people that say the Nazi movement was something different than what it was taken over into. There's people that say, like, we there's so much we don't know. Um, and I don't try and like fit any one of them. I just kind of look at these theories and go, okay, that's interesting and keep going. I don't like make my identity off of them. And when people do make their identity off of some of these theories, that's where they get in trouble. And that's where their ego will not want to be wrong. <laughs> that at it, any, yeah. Yeah. At any cost. At any cost. Exactly. Um, I had someone right before we were talking about this, uh, what I do is I show people how to get rid of um, immu immunization ingredients out of your body. And there are people who don't care about healing from immunizations. They just have so much hatred that they want people who got the shot to die. And they want to be right more than getting the information of how to safely chelate the metals, the cancer genes, the parasite genes out of your body from the shot. And they just want people to die who got it. And it's really, really ugly. And we do have to deal with this a lot um, in my field. So it's just like they'd rather be right than give people the oxidizers to safely get the shot out of them. Well, there's one of these choices in that timeline that just popped up and populated today. I don't know if you guys saw, but Russia claiming that they have some sort of injectable treatment for the big C. Oh, Ooh. and also I heard that they're informing about a threat uh, globally of, that is maybe coming from Russia. And we're like, is that the same information like that they are claiming that they can do this for people? All Just like. So I was like, oh, this is a great day to shoot this video. <laughs> it's a perfect day yes. because homie King of England or whatever is sick with the big C and yeah. then. Guess who has the the offering, right? It's the same thing. Like you're on the path and now you're getting this choice number, whatever, seven or whatever we're at yeah. now. Like yeah. what choice layer is this? And it's really just your ego. Is your ego going to be cool enough to try something that could save your life? Or is your ego going to be paid for by big pharma and you don't even take that? It's very interesting. It'll be interesting. I'm, I'm curious how that's going to develop. <laughs> um, it's interesting. Uh <laughs> I think a year ago, everyone said Putin had cancer. And I was like, no, he doesn't. He knows because because all of the clinical studies that I've done, a lot of them are Russian for the stuff yes. I talk about, like chlorine dioxide, <laughs> hydrogen peroxide. So I'm like, OK, first of all, no, Russia knows the cures. Like, why are they doing this? But that's probably why they're probably saying he did have cancer and he cured it with this. And um I've always looked at our analytics and we've had Russian people check out a lot of our stories. And I know that a, I don't know if it's real, but a Kremlin was looking at our very own Jenny Constantine last week. It was real. Oh, I freaking checked that shit seven, eight, nine, ten times. I, I lost my mind for like four hours. I like, showed my I husband. Was, I was like, the Kremlin's watching us. Like we Kremlin, can get a screenshot. Not of that only Kremlin. did the Kremlin view my stories, they sent me a heart reaction. <laughs> like literally it's the largest official account associated with like it's a real account it's a real what? account it's a real account totally and, you know I obviously mean. putin is not on a smartphone scrolling through people's stories but somebody was and i called my dad and, <laughs> and my mom was there too and the word traitor was brought up the word disown was brought up because i'm telling you right now so edgar casey we've talked about edgar casey yes we have 
he was a devout, uh, uh, I believe he was a devout Christian. He was a, what you would consider a medical medium. And he was like, he's still famous, famous then, he's famous now. And he, he talked a great deal about Atlantis, but he also did mention that the, the out of Russia will come the hope of the world. And there was something about that, that, that stuck with me even before the, uh, 2016 election, before the great awakening really started picking up in momentum. And so, you know, ta- this is why Russia was not allowed to join NATO. This is why Russia is so heavily demonized in the whole entire world. This is why we, they want us to think that Putin is a bloodthirsty animal when he's not. The man is like unilaterally among, you know, along with a small group of allies, um, unilaterally trying to fight, you know, fight this from the inside. And people come at me, they're like, he's a mason. It's a big club and we're not in it. It's like, you idiot. Like, you idiot. Yes. Like, adapt. Adapt, <laughs> quicker. adapt quicker. Okay. This isn't 2005, 2006. Uh, conspiracy theories is we're not at 9-11 was an inside job base entry level conspiracy shit at this point like yeah with the times you're the motherfucking dragon so there are gray areas there are people that play roles his role is like he's like the i don't know exactly what we would consider it but yeah, that was a fabulous interview, by the way, Tucker. Daddy, and daddy. I love, no one talks about like the biggest part where he kind of told Tucker, no one said this. He's like, uh, you know, the CIA, the people you wanted to work for so bad. And then whenever he brought up the CIA, he like directly said, you know, you to Tucker. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, dude, people are like, he was referring directly. Part. Yes. He's directly. <laughs> he yeah. He's going it was the most high key shade. If I could do a backflip, I would have done it. He shaded him for getting rejected by the CIA and kept talking. And you could see Tucker <laughs> try to maintain his poker face so bad. But there's no recovering from a burn like that. It's like somebody, somebody get the butter. You know what I mean? Tucker it needs is. help. He's oh my God. Tired. And there's nothing he could do because you know he was CIA. But Putin is such a classy diplomat that he even was like, listen, it's okay. I was a young man too. I had a job at the KGB. We all know about that. Yeah. Yeah, intelligence, a job is a job. It's fine. He's like, but I, I bet you're pretty happy that didn't work out. Now, didn't you know? Like, yeah, now yeah. aren't you? Oh my god, that so one was funny. funny for the books. Oh my god, Edgar Casey, I can't believe how much he just comes up in all. Because of course, I do have Beyond the Biohacking channel on Rumble and Telegram, and we often shared this book, Edgar Casey and the Paul McChristy. Um, it is all about how to use basically castor oil to like cure everything. And it's not just one way, like usually books nowadays for cures and stuff, they only tell you like, oh, this is the one way to use it. No, like he tells you to slather it on your body, different parts. He tells you to ingest it. He tells you to freeze it and ingest it. He tells you to put it like the amount of ways that castor oil can be used for healing is like ridiculous. So I always tell people have a copy of the Palma Christi. Um, this is the one of the healing books that um, you can kind of heal everything with. So I thought that was interesting that you brought that up as well. The yeah, I'm character. glad you mentioned he was a Christian as well, because I actually never caught that, that he was like, He's and you were saying devout, devout like passionate. And I, it's so important that people make that distinction because so often in this field we're demonized as doing something that is against Christ or or work of the devil. And it's like, talk to Edgar fucking Casey about that. Mm-hmm. Say that to his face. You know what I mean? Check out his body of work. He he loved Jesus Christ m- more than you know. A Karen loves a sale at Kmart. Are, is there even a, is there even Kmart anymore? Did they shut that? Oh my God. No, they, I don't think there is Kmart anymore. However, I was in trouble when I was 11 (laughs) and um, Harry Potter came out to DVD. I wanted Harry Potter so bad, but I was like kind of in trouble. But my dad's like, the only way that you can get the Harry Potter DVD is if you walk into Kmart and buy it. And I was crying because I hated Kmart. And I walked my ass into Kmart, bought my Harry Potter first DVD and walked out. And that was the first Harry Potter thing I did was at Kmart. It's burned in my mind. Kmart is a godless, a godless fuck palace. That's exactly, it's a, it's a godless fuck palace <laughs> that's what it is right. i happen to believe that kmart uh the dmv 
and a lot of these like strip mall, not even strip malls, regular malls, like hanger outlets. Yeah. There, I, I think that they are like entrances to the back rooms. Like when the lights go off and it's nighttime, I think that these are like hubs. They're literally like yes. portals for the underground. And because I'm telling you, like some of these places are so sketchy, even in broad daylight, you're like, ooh, like my nightmare would be getting like locked into a your regular run of the mill mall in any small town in America, getting shut in. Like you're getting traffic. Like something's like coming out of the walls, gonna pull you into the back rooms like the back rooms are real it's a game the kids are playing now it's called the back rooms it's like a literally this like underground underbelly of society that ex- exists like right beneath our ability like it's like right in front of us that's where they're taking the kids and stuff Alrighty, and something else that just popped up post edit lexi here um we have a very very close friend here of ricky leaks Jack Pendergrass. Please check out Jack Pendergrass's work. Um, I think we've done like three or four videos over here with him on as a guest. Each video is mind blowing. His research that he has come out with is the scariest research I have found in the awakening. Um, I'm very, very proud of him. But I mean, if you just go to rumble.com and search Jack Pendergrass, it'll have my videos with him plus him on Emma Imagination Podcast and like a bunch of other um, various podcasts. And he covers this, the scariest (laughs) um, company, the scariest secret ops in our country, really in the world. It is a worldwide um, company. And they're using your tax dollars and they are, everyone hears about BlackRock and Vanguard, but the real scary guys in any war, you're not going to know the name, Um, but they know who you are. And it's basically this company called Maximus Inc. And they just had, like, this is his biggest um, moment to shine. He made it on a medium Dot, oh, you can't see that. Medium.com. Um, journalist Claire Best wrote, alongside with Jack Pendergrass's knowledge, wrote an amazing article, Is the CIA Operating a Power Grab Behind the Front of Maximus? Starts off with by saying, the CIA is in the news of late. <laughs> Thanks, Putin. Uh, what's not in the news and should be is Maximus. And the question is whether the CIA and Maximus are one and the same. Maximus Inc. is a government services provider operating in U.S., U.K., Canada, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and Israel. It primarily started out with Medicaid contracts, tying it to Catholic charities, and providing health care and children's services. Please go read that article. Please go watch I'll list them down below, um, our work with Jack Pendergrass. He basically tied the military industrial complex to everything. But what really scares me is he tied it to child protective services and child custody cases. We all know that CPS loses child children by the thousands. We all know the CIA has its hand in child harvesting and things of that nature go to cia.com look up spy kids they have an entire web page directed to it it's not just something fiction so yeah i'm very very proud of our friend jack pendergrass but in this harry potter series we're talking about the overreach of these literally black nobility families coming into our sector Um, this is going to be the most real life version um that no one's talking about basic low-level conspiracy theorists are always going to want to talk about black rock and vanguard but it it's much scarier than that so um it's to the point that i don't even trust some big truther channels because we have sent this information over to them and they're just still talking about election interference (laughs) look at the dominion yeah we have that proof got it good why aren't you talking about maximus why It's weird that you have the information. Um, Yeah, I side-eye people who aren't talking about Maximus. If they have the information, give it to them. So 
I applaud medium.com for posting this article. I am so proud of my boy, Jack Pendergrass. Go check out his work. Um, I, we did a series on stranger things and he explains how stranger things is really happening in real life. So go check it out. Thank you so much for joining this chat and we will talk to you guys later. Bye. And that's why they all have the missing persons photos at the customer service because they're servicing customers. Like they're literally selling these places like Walmart and everything are selling those kids. They're not missing. They are for sale. It's really gross. How could I forget Walmart? That was the, that's the main one. Yeah, they're like, yep, servicing customers. These pieces of, and, oh my god, I hate it here so much. Oh no, you did it. Down. Why did you do that? <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. Yeah. I know. What I'm an burn oversight. It down. I cannot believe I missed that all my life. <laughs> it's bad. It that's a dark hole, and it gets bad. But we're gonna uncover it, and um, don't be surprised when you see these. And what does both Kmart and Walmart sell? They sell Chinese stuff. Everything Chinese China is China. Yeah. Chinese. So it's like, um, yeah, they're they're the biggest sellouts ever, and they have taken away all the mom and pop shops. Mm -hmm. You used to have cute little towns that just had a hardware store, that just had a fabric store, that just had a pest control. And then they were taken over by these department stores and you can't even compete with China prices. And that's, and again, when we're only given one or two choices and they're both lies, of course, everyone thinks that capitalism is bad. And it's like, you guys, we're not even in capitalism. If we were in capitalism, we would have millions of stores to be able to go to. But no, we only have Target or Walmart. That's all. Or Amazon. That's all you have. That's not a capitalist society. That is socialism. That is a fate. Well, it's more of like corporate socialism it's horrible it's not even a real capitalist society so it's really sad that like we're not even living in the type of cool environment that we could a real capitalist society be awesome because you would have competition you would have a totally different life than what we're a free market you would see people really compete and original ideas be fostered and People are stepping up their game because there's a lot of healthy competition and there's a lot going on, but everything's monopolized. And I don't know, I don't know if there's a way around it. Like if you were, if you guys really listened to what Putin was saying, he was kind of lovingly and in a sensitive way telling the American people, like, listen, I know this is hard for you guys because in your bubble, you are the best in the world and you have always been the best in the world. That is your programming as Americans. Yeah. But yeah. I, he's like, I urge you to understand that the world has changed while you guys were busy with Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Britney Spears and yep. the Super Bowl, you know? And so it's a little scary because he's like, listen, oh God, that was the best interview ever. And it's like, it's terrifying, but the truth is the truth. America, where we stand in relation to the rest of the world has changed. And the American psyche, I don't know if collectively we're ready to face the music. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to like, I don't believe that that means we have to endure punishment for the next 500 years. I just think it's like rather a, a, a relatively small window of concentrated hardship. We'll call it concentrated like, you know, pivot. Yeah. Um, to then so hopefully, you know, figure it out. But I just, I just don't know how we're going to sort of get ourselves out of this, um, this situation with China where they just essentially like they own everything, like they run the show here. How do we fight that? Well, I, I have asked myself this a lot. And the thing is, there is something that China needs as well. Okay. It looks like they're this huge, big, scary force. But because yeah. years, decades ago that they made everyone only have one or two children. Yeah. Now they have like 95% male population. Well, that's only going to get you so far. Having 95% of your civilization not be able to produce, you're not going to have a civilization when those gay men turn oh. old so it's like okay they seem big and bad but if they want their seed if they want their nation to continue they're going to need to mate with the rest of the world so do we like are going asian to guys? what do you guys like asian guys well you guys are both taken i'm taken 
<laughs> You're like, I'm good. Me and my husband were just talking about that this morning because it's Valentine's Day and we were being all lovey dovey. And we're just like, oh my God, we met in 2012, like when the world was supposed to end. And like, oh, right. we never it's went just- on any dating websites. Like, we were like, no, we met each other the old fashioned way, naked at a Halloween party. And we're like, yeah, we're going to stay together forever. And we just did. But I don't know how these people date it's scary as oh my god i feel it's, so scared it's, well as a single woman when i can't even say that i date i'm i'm an i observe and occasionally i i guess i get involved but i think the it's post covid the biggest thing is probably people's um medical like status basically because the vaccine has changed everything yeah um and so i'm just you know it's it is. Who's clean? Who's got that clean dick? Exactly. Who's got the clean D? Who's got, you know, who we don't, it's weird because it kind of like mirrors what's got, what happens in the wizarding world with the, you know, the dirty blood. Obviously that was more based off of, um, yeah, you know, yes. uh, magical not versus non-magical, but here we are. It's like, you know, the population is now infected with something that alters their very essence. And the rest of us are yeah. trying to, hold on to this shred of like divinity. It's like a light that's in your blood, a light that comes from within and whatever is in this technology was designed in part to see, like sort of siphon that light out. So it's just a weird game right now. It's so weird. The, another thing we didn't really bring up too, too much in this series is ever since the very first one, when you, yes, we always have these, um, Like we talked about the black family tree, which goes probably into the black nobility of what we have to deal with in real life. The 13 bloodlines, everything like this. Like, did you go to school with someone who had the last name Disney or or, um, Onassis? No, because they don't mate with us. So the whole thing that is this background, it's a child's book, obviously, but there is mention of, yes, mate with muggles. If you are pure blood, mate with muggles, it makes the magic different. It almost makes it more creative. It almost makes it better. Like, um, mate with muggles. It will only do good for the world. And actually, it does a really cool, like Hermione, completely muggle. But she's still the most clever witch of her age. And she say, she was part of saving the world. If it wasn't for a muggle-born kid, no one would be alive, basically, as free men. Um and, and the free men in itself, I want to do a Pirates of the Caribbean type storyline after Star Wars because all pirate stories are explaining this ultimate story of being free men. If you are on the waters, you can have your free person. And this goes into the earliest forms of what we call Freemasons. And the Freemasons started again. They've obviously been corrupted and taken over, but they started off as being free men who were not ruled by the crown and they had their own boats and you, you're you a free person. This is why we see much so much of the black sails and the skull and bones in some of these bad Masonic groups because it all goes back to these pirate days. And um, on Journey to Truth, I did a magic episode where I go heavily into explaining maritime law and admiral law, which is the law of the oceans. So um, the pirate talk would be really cool if we want to do that later on this year but um yeah what does freedom mean to you and how what are you willing to do to obtain it um back to the choices okay so we're on a flat plane we're on a globe we're on a turtle we're on a ship we're on a vessel we're on we're we're atlantis we are atlantis we forgot we are atlantis we are covered by a dome because there was a deluge trying to get rid of all the bad people of atlantis and then um all of these theories the same proofs would be still true for all of them. So, you know, keep your eyes open. And then I have Hakate saying something up in the corner going, well, a ship is always female. 
sense, a vessel literally means womb. And there's a story of a sea dragon's womb being ripped apart from its body, making the um, Orion yeah. belt from the upper half and making Earth from her womb. And that was taken over millions of years ago in a galactic war called the Orion War. And they cover Regulus and Sirius in a different light. Um, and this is the story of the Enuma Elish, the original Babylonian origin story and i will put the link of my favorite video of this and they actually show it as um tiamat is a planet that was ripped apart but a lot of other stories say that she was like a sea dragon that was ripped apart and mm -hmm. that's like okay that still is a vessel that still is a female that still mm -hmm. is a like it still makes sense for everything but um it's just a different way of looking at it so I love it. Yes. I hadn't heard that uh, specifically, like the womb of a sea serpent or a, a, some sort of dragon, water dragon or something. Yes. Tiamat. Tiamat. Isn't, that, isn't that the uh, Sumerian origin story? Yep. yep. So yep. this is going to be the elite. That's like, that's like, we're talking. That's yes. old. Yeah. This is one of the uh, the oldest uh, story, and it's the beautiful sea dragon. And hey there, post edit Lexi here. Um, I'm going to be placing a quick overview of the Enuma Elish. There are dozens, hundreds, thousands of documentaries and various Gnostics um, theses on this oldest story sumerian babylonian creation story called the enuma elish again we do not want you to go worshiping anyone so do not come out of this worshiping um apu or en inki or diamat just kind of understand the story go oh that's interesting and move on when you look up the enuma elish you are going to see stories of the characters being like dragons or sea serpents, which is why I'm not so far off with that turtle idea. Um, and other, other people explain them as planets. And so either a sea dragon or a planet that has water on it is kind of the idea um, of the story. So again, it's a very interesting story. I'm going to play like a couple minutes of my favorite version because I love the Baba Yetu song so much and they bring it in with the Baba Yetu. It is the Lord's Prayer. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it in, is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And so it is. The earth that how we know it is kind of the uterus of this bigger planet or dragon that used to exist and um, the other half of our body, earth's body, um, is actually the asteroid belt. So um, that is the story I'm about to show. Enjoy. But go watch like the real version. I'm just showing you a quick little tidbit. Now this is the account of the celestial battle and how the earth had come to be and of Nabir's destiny. The Lord went forth, his fated course he followed. Toward the raging Tiamat he set his face, he spelled with his lips he uttered, as a cloak for protection, he the pulsar and the emitter put on. With the fearsome radiance, his head was crowned. On his right he posted the smiter, on the left the repeller he placed. The seven winds, his host of helpers, like a storm he sent forth. Toward the raging Tiamat, he was rushing, clamoring for battle. The gods thronged about him, then from his path they departed. To scan Tiamat and her helpers alone, he was advancing. The scheme of Kingu her host commander, to conceive. When he saw valiant Kingu, blurred became his vision. As he gazed upon the monsters, his direction was distracted. His course became upset, his doings were confused. 
Tiamat's band tightly hurt and circled. With terror they trembled. Tiamat, to her roots, gave a shudder, a mighty roar she admitted. On the Biru, she cast a spell, engulfed him with her charms. The issue between them was joined. The battle was unavoided. Face to face they came, Tiamat and the Biru. Against each other they were advancing. Day for battle approached. They pressed on for single combat. The Lord spread his net. To encompass her, he cast it. With fury, Tiamat cried out. Like, like one, one possessed, possessed, she lost, lost her senses. senses. The evil wind, which had been behind him, Nibiru drove forward. In her face, he let it loose. She opened her mouth, the evil wind to swallow, but could not close her lips. The evil wind charged her belly. Into her innards it made its way. Her innards were howling. Her body was distended. Her mouth was wide open. Through the opening, Nibiru shot a brilliant arrow, a lightning most divine. It pierced her innards. Her belly, it tore apart. It tore into her womb. It split apart her heart. Having thus subdued her, her life breath he extinguished. The lifeless body, Nibiru surveyed, like a slaughtered carcass Tiamat now was. Beside the lifeless mistress, her eleven helpers trembled with terror. In Nibiru's net, they were captured. Unable they were to flee. Kingu, who by Tiamat was made the host chief, was among them. The Lord put him in fetters. To his lifeless mistress, he bound him. He wrested from Kingu the tablets of destinies, unrightly to him given. Stamped it with his own seal, fastened the destiny to his own chest. The others of Tiamat's band, as captives he bound, in his circuit he them ensnared. He trampled them underfoot, cut them up to pieces. He bound them all to his circuit, to turn around he made them, backward to course. Upper part to a region unknown carried, with her the bound Kingu, who was also exiled, of the severed part a companion to be. The hinder part's fate Nibiru then considered, as an everlasting trophy of the battle he wished it to be, a constant reminder in the heavens, a place of the battle to enshrine. With his mace, the hinder part he smashed the bits and pieces, then strung them together as a band to form a hammered bracelet, locking them together as watchmen he stationed them. A firmament, to divide the waters from the waters. The upper waters above the firmament, from the waters below it he separated. Artful works Nibiru thus fashioned. The Lord then crossed the heavens to survey the regions. From Opsi's quarter to the abode of Gaga he measured the dimensions. The edge of the deep Nibiru then examined. Toward his birthplace he cast his gaze. He paused and hesitated. Then to the firmament, the place of the battle, slowly he returned. Passing again in Opsu's region of the sun's missing spouse he thought of with remorse. He gazed upon Tiamat's wounded half. To her upper part he gave attention. The waters of life, her bounty, from the wounds were still pouring. Her golden veins, Opsu's rays were reflecting. The seed of life, his creator's legacy, Nibiru then remembered. When he trod on Tiamat, when he split her asunder, to her the seed he surely imparted. He addressed words to Opsu, to him thus saying, with your warming rays to the wounds give healing. Let the broken part new life be given, and your family as a daughter to be. Let the waters to one place be gathered, let firm land appear. By firm land let her be called, Ki, henceforth her name to be. Absu to the words of Nibiru gave heed. Let the earth join my family. Ki, firm land of the below, let earth her name henceforth be. What me and Jenny always go back to is basically this idea that um, the Arthurian myths are real. And if you're dealing with Arthur, you have to look at Merlin, who was Merlin was different than all the old magic of the time because he was baptized. Merlin was half human, half incubi, incubus. And he was a crazy little demon child until somebody baptized him. And then he kept his magical power, but it was like cleansed by God. So he helped this King Arthur kind of, you know, do all their bidding. And there is a story or a prophecy, if you're believing the um, King Arthur story, that 
two dragons are going to duel it out at the end. And of course, all the biblical scholars think that this means e England and Scotland are going to fight or England and America are going to fight. And those being the two dragons, which I mean, the American continent does literally look like a dragon. Um, but yeah, this dragon energy does come up a lot um, in prophecies, even outside of the Enuma Elish. And when we talk about Merlin, um, it's so funny. There are pretty big accounts on YouTube that never mentioned Merlin and never mentioned the stuff we've been talking about, but their last few videos have been about all the stuff we've covered. Um, so, you know, what is it called when someone imitates you? It's the biggest form of flattery. Right. Yeah. So um, very interesting that we are bringing these methods and these ideas all around a circle. So let's move on. Um, what I wanted you to get from that is if you hear the first two choices, keep walking. There's probably more that they're trying to hide from you. Okay. Um, Voldy's. Oh, okay. So I mentioned this briefly earlier. Voldemort is trying to find this entire series from the first book till now. He is trying to find a way to stay alive because Voldemort realizes very early on, you cannot just take over the world in one lifetime. You have to either be in, become immortal or you have to like have horcruxes and keep resurrecting life life after life to play a long game basically so there's different ways throughout this harry potter series that we see the immortality factor come in in the first book he's trying to get the philosopher's stone or the sorcerer's stone and that's why we brought up nicholas flamel nicholas flamel by the way is a real person he actually did real work with real world governments so they talk about this man and they explain that nicholas flamel was the last person to have the philosopher's stone and that's why we see voldemort first show up when harry potter was at hogwarts um, we also saw in that same one, they had to basically become a vampire and drink innocent blood um, until they received the Philosopher's Stone. So throughout the series, we see how do you stay alive? Um, you become a master of death and you obtain the trinity of artifacts called the Deathly Hollows, which we'll get into in a second. That's one way that you can become a master of death and not die basically in this world, or you can obtain the philosopher's stone, which has already been taken care of and hidden, or you can become a vampire and drink innocent blood. My favorite way to live forever is to remember that you are an immortal being and you can just do a parasite cleanse with oxidizers and carbon and, uh, make sure you always have positive ionic trace minerals and binders and you will live longer than if you didn't do that. That's my favorite way to live forever. So instead um, of rubbing it on your forehead, just eat it. Today. Wait, what? <laughs> I said, instead of rubbing it on your forehead, put a little in your mouth as well. Yes. Yeah. For people who don't know, know it's Ash Wednesday. Oh my God, it, it is. Yeah, it's today know, it's crazy. It's come. Everything's happening so fast. It's like, what do we do? Do you guys have any ashes? Can we do it to ourselves, or is that like against? We, we're not supposed to because they said it closes your third eye. It when you put cross over it. Like I always thought that was so crazy. I'm like, you guys don't do it. They used to do it for us at school. I don't know if you guys went to like a Catholic school. We had to do it, and we always had the option, and I always opted out. And third fourth grade i'm like no i'm good yeah i'm jewish i'm not jewish but i would just say <laughs> <You> just, whatever <laughs> one no. year i say i'm jewish the next year i'm muslim it's just like you just, don't have to do that. that's funny. anything yeah. else anything else is your option stay away from me with your with your dirty hands please sir thank you <laughs> One of the biggest ways and what Jenny is explaining, um, one of the biggest ways that if you're under spiritual attack or um, if you're being bad, you know, us who understand or maybe research the occult, one thing you can do to like protect yourself is to go like this. Like if you're being 
attacked, you basically make a cross with your hands over your third eye and it almost acts as like an evil eye repellent. But um, if you're doing this <laughs> with ashes and you do it over your third eye and a lot of them use the bad cross as well on top of a cross, they use like the upside down. It's bad. It's bad. Um, yeah. Like, what are you guys doing? It shouldn't be done. And that goes into the type of um, false idol worship. And you're kind of idling the ashes, not the person. It's really weird. So I don't like necessarily doing that. But I love my charcoal still. I just like to take it internally. <laughs> Every day. Every day, not just once a year. <laughs> not just once a year. This is a commitment. Exactly. Exactly. I um, bought that charcoal, but I never used. It. Like I never took it. So, like, when do I take it on an empty stomach? Or I'm making you guys, which I'm really glad I didn't send it out because I actually do have a webcam that I'm not using anymore, and I just haven't had money to send out your guys' it. stuff. So I was gonna, I'll throw that in your, I'll throw that into your bag, but I'll um give you like a schedule of when to take stuff and if you do charcoal do it at nighttime because you don't want charcoal to grab like any supplements or nutrition that you're putting in your body because it will it will grab onto those and get them out of you and you won't be able to use them so if you do charcoal you do it before you go to bed okay yeah so the viewers about the quality of my audio and my video this is like the fourth webcam that i've destroyed in the past year and i don't know why but so thank you <laughs> keep wearing glasses that's one of the easiest ways to keep protected and to keep your cameras protected is to wear contacts or glasses um because yeah when we're making this there are bad people trying to curse us and um you'll be able to tell because your mic or your camera will be killed <laughs> from it the real life magic that the muggles don't know that's there okay so um and then voldemort is trying to like the way he's always tried to stay alive which isn't obviously the best way even for an evil guy is to kill someone make a horcrux into an object and keep resurrecting but this takes a lot of trust of other people because ultimately like he had a trust in Wormtail, a rat, to bring him back. And that's, you don't know if someone's always, you can't always trust your followers to bring you back. Um, it's a lot of wasted time. Like, he doesn't want to do the Horcruxes. And also, the Horcruxes can be destroyed, and therefore, it's no longer able to be used again. So the whole time, there are two separate race against time journeys in this story. One is Harry, Hermione, and Ron went off into their own and they are trying to find all the horcruxes and trying to destroy all the horcruxes so that they cannot kill Voldemort until all the horcruxes are you know ruined and then on the other hand Voldemort he knows this is happening because him and Harry share like kind of share thoughts so he knows that Harry is trying to kill all the Horcruxes and he knows that he is doing it slowly but surely so Voldemort the entire seventh book is trying to find the three Deathly Hollows so we see Voldemort get Ollivander and even Grimwald is it Grimwald the name yeah and basically these are the people who owned or made the um, well owned the Deathly Hollows. So there's two different things kind of going on that people don't realize um, throughout the entire thing. So the Deathly Hollows, it's a fiction child's book. It is a child's book that explains how to conquer death. And the people who know what's up, they know that the child's book is telling the truth. And a lot of people are like, oh my God, why are you spending time talking about a child's fiction book? You're so stupid. And it's like, nope. It, I, I see what's going on. It's a real story, which is hilarious because Harry Potter is a child's book that is telling us the real story. And the Deathly Hollows is a story about three siblings, three brothers, one of them um, who meet death and they outsmart death. And death is like, ah, you got me. What do you guys want? I'll give you whatever you want. 
you, you got me. And the one of the brothers is like, I want to be the most powerful influencer in the world. I want all the money. You have to watch me. Behold me. And he asked for the most powerful wand ever made. Um, I have problems with this because technically there were no like wands before this one. This was the first one in the story. And um he very quickly loses the wand because when you go for power and just what we call influencers, quite literally, who gets the views, who gets the, who gets like the popular person award basically is what power is in this older sibling's eyes. So he quickly gets killed because if you're just going after power, you, there will always be someone stronger who wants it more than you. And it's just going to be a constant fight of people trying to steal this elder wand. And we've gone into the fact that elder wood, especially in the UK is very significant with Christianity, paganism. And, um, the elder wood is just very interesting and that's what it's made from. And it's the most powerful wand ever basically. And then you have the second sibling who was like, Oh, I lost the love of my life and my life is ruined and I just want it back. Oh my goodness. I want to resurrect my dead wife or girlfriend or whatever. So he gets the resurrection stone. And this reminds me of on Aladdin when Jeannie's like, I don't bring ba people back from the dead. It's an ugly job. Don't ask me to do it. And also practical magic. Don't bring people back from the dead. It's not going to be who you think it is. And we see yeah. this in the Deathly Hollows. Um, he yeah. tries to bring back his wife and she's not his wife basically. So he um, commits suicide. And then you have the baby who is like, I just want to be protected no matter what. I don't want to die an untimely death. I just want to be protected. And death gives the youngest child part of his cloak and he will be invisible. So you have the three artifacts known as the deathly hollows. And if you have all three of them in one sitting, you will not be able to die basically. <sighs> I'm not a fan say. of the resurrection theme, but it seems to be big time, like big time conversation for our society and like how prevalent that situation is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like you said, the zombie dream you had. Go on. It's just so true. Like it was the energies I was feeling before we started this video was the resurrection theme was the biggest one that I think that I wanted to cover in this video. And just how unfortunately like how dangerous and how it's been logically and mentally derived and repeated instead of the original i feel like the original purpose of that sort of metaphor and now it's like this extreme logical attempt at achieving almost a metaphor and forcing life and death from our own hand instead of just letting nature do its thing and stop being so controlling. Yes. That's the biggest thing is stop being so controlling. A lot of these diseases that we deal with, of course, every disease is like, there's an emotional aspect behind all disease. If you have cancer, you have extreme grief or anger that you won't get over. Um, if you have Parkinson's, people who shake with Parkinson's, they are the people who are the most controlling. They have to control everything. So your body literally takes away the control of using your own body. And it's like trying to teach you like you're not in control. So the people, and I know people in my life who have Parkinson's and they are the most controlling people in the world. They will not help you. It has to be their way. And they ended up with this sickness and it takes over them. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, this is your lot to learn in life is to not be controlling over others, um, which is really interesting. And in the Bible, we hear about the dead will return at like the revelations theory is that as uh, speaking of resurrection, the dead will resurrect. And I think when I think of this story, yes, on Lord of the Rings and Rick and I have covered a series of seven video for Tolkien, but the only way that the last final battle for Lord of the Rings wins is because they get all these dead armies 
and they bring the dead back for one final battle. And it's the dead who actually come and um, kill all the bad guys at the final battle for Lord of the Rings. And then they ascend afterwards and they're finally no longer kept on earth, um, which is really cool. So the dead will come back to fight at the very, very end. But in real life, what have we been seeing these past seven years? We keep hearing about the Mandala effect and the Mandala effect is this idea that a bunch of people remember Nelson Mandela dying at one period of time. And then 10, 15, 20 years later, <laughs> Nelson Mandela died again. And we're all like, um, I swear I remember him dying like 10 years ago. What the heck? And everyone's like, no, he just died now. So it's the idea of he wasn't dead on this other timeline. So I truly believe we are surfing timelines. Um, I've had my own mandala effect with my husband. It was in 2015. It, we, my husband and I were driving to work and we were at this one stoplight in Phoenix and we were listening to our favorite morning radio show. And it was 2015. We didn't know that people were good or bad. We were like asleep and we heard that Patton Oswald died and his wife was on the airwaves that morning and his wife was like yeah Patton died it's so sad and she came on the morning radio show to talk about how sad it was that Patton Oswald died her husband and then three years later like 2017 or 18 um my husband and I were driving were driving again we were at the same stoplight and we were listening to the radio and there was a um, commercial on the radio station that said, Pat and Oswald will be here on tour. And we're like, what? Like, we almost got in a wreck. We're like, he died. Like, what are you talking about? He's on tour. And on this timeline, it was Pat and Oswald's wife that died in 2015, not him. And the weirdest thing is, if you go to his Twitter, when she died, he kind of says something along the lines of, like, thanks for taking one for the team. Like, it was Oh, my so gosh. Weird. So weird. No. So, yes, yes, I do think we are colliding timelines where if someone died on one timeline, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, on every timeline that person is I dead. Mean, that might explain why when I get clients and they have all kinds of different questions, they people I can't tell you how many times I've gotten the question is uh, this Kennedy alive? Is this Kennedy alive? People want to know if like people, celebrities, certain politicians, like world yeah. leaders, are they truly dead? And sometimes the cards register as if this person is it's like they have a pulse. It's like they're they're here, but they're not. And so it turns out that like these realities are kind of vibrating on top of each other. Yes. And with enough like collective conscientious choice, we can actually move ourselves ever so slightly over to the left, so to speak, or the right, so to speak. And I don't mean that literally, it's figuratively. Correct. Correct. But it, so apparently like some of these people in major versions, like collectively bulked up versions of the timeline, a lot of these people are in fact still alive. So it's like, it's just it's kind of a mind fuck, isn't it? Yeah. Correct. And not just politicians. This could be happening so many different ways that we don't even know. Oh, yeah. Yes, totally. If they died on one timeline, they legitimately could have died. Not like faked their death. Like they legitimately could have died. But that was a different timeline if we're on. I've even had my parents explain family vacations and they talk about like um, souvenirs that were got gotten on the vacations and like we remember the souvenirs different and we have the souvenirs and they remember, I remember it had to do with one of those German drinking cups and that's what they remember getting, but someone else remembers and has a scarf that was actually gotten from Germany, not the cup, but my mom has like pictures of the cup. Like it's so weird. And it, I remember that was like one, another Mandela effect just within my own family that my sister saw it was really weird um but yeah like don't question reality because it changes and that's why so many people who are for sure and steadfast on one way of thinking it's like well just stay open to change because it's changing constantly it's really weird very very weird strange uh, okay where were we so 
Harry, okay, Harry's not looking. I wanted to make that clear. Harry is not necessarily looking for the Deathly Hollows. He's looking for the Horcruxes that we know Voldemort has made, and he is slowly destroying them. And that's shown beautifully in the book. Um, one of the scenes, and I did mention it earlier, was Winter's Tale. Winter's Tale, I don't even think it's in the Harry Potter books, but it's in the Harry Potter movies. Correct me if I'm wrong. But scene where they try to ru they try to destroy the locket um which is one of the horcruxes and they have gryffindor's sword they give ron the sword of gryffindor and they're like you have to kill this locket and yeah. what ron sees take place is the locket comes to life and it shows ron his worst possible fear and that is Hermione um making out with I'm Harry. Out with Harry. <laughs> Do you remember the scene? Yes, of course, but imagine that's your biggest fear, someone making out with somebody else. Like that's it. Like not your family dying, not like you oh, know, I know, right? It's like they they kissed. Oh my god. Yep. So it's his woman and his best friend and he doesn't get his woman. His best friend does. And it's funny because the winter's tale is the first time in literature that we hear Hermione. Well, some people say that there's another Hermione in Greek culture and it's um, a different take on Hermes name. And mm -hmm. one of the gods made a Hermione um, in because Hermes did something for her. So she had her kid named it after him. So that is one of the Hermione's as well, but in the winter's tale, no. that is where we see Hermione. Um, in, and it's exactly the same scene. It's one of, it's a star crossed lovers and they see the woman making love to the best friend. And we see this in Harry Potter and Ron overcomes that fear and destroys the locket. And um, yeah, he, he gets past his biggest fear. He does. He does do it. That's a crazy, it's a wild scene. Very crazy. I already Harry and uh, and Hermione like that. I was just like, oh no, no, God, stop! It's so gross. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So in, I mean, there's a bunch of Shakespeare. I definitely uh, want everyone outside of this because I know I didn't even cover it, but to look at the similarities of J.K. Rowling and Shakespeare. I know I missed a bunch, but the idea is the Macbeth story. The story of Macbeth, um, whenever you're dealing with the Scottish Highlands and kings and um, the stealing of a child, it's very Macbeth, and that's where we first see Hecate. Hecate gave a warning in Macbeth, which we see played out in Harry Potter. And Hamlet. Hamlet's all about killing the parents, and the Hamlet is trying to uh, spend the entire play trying to get revenge for the man who killed his parents. So the world is a stage as far as the what we are on per Shakespeare. The shape of Earth was simply a stage and we are merely actors on it. Okay, so Battle of Hogwarts. The, we're at the end. We are at the end. Um, we have received, om we've almost ruined all of the Horcruxes. Um, the kids have. They just need to kill Nagini and they need to find Ravenclaw's diadem, which is the tiara, which is at, which is hidden in the school. And we know that. So this is a really hard scene to watch. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth fighting and um, I did skip over the Malfoy Manor scenes, but basically there was a quick moment there where we actually first saw Dobby die and uh, Dobby died by saving the children from the Malfoy Manor. And um, there was, oh goodness, who were the kids? It was Hermione. She got beat up by Bellatrix. She went under the Cruciatus curse. Um, Harry was there. Luna, Luna Lovegood. Lovegood. Dean Thomas. They were all being tortured. Neville. I think Neville. Neville. Thank you. Uh, they were all being tortured at Malfoy Manor. And Dobby was able to save all the kids. So even though he's super annoying, he did come through he at the very through. end. 
um, because the kids would have died if it wasn't for him. And then so we get out of the Malfoy Manor. We also saw what else did I want to cover that I missed? Oh, Hed Hedwig died um, during flight in the very beginning of the series. And that is why I also wanted to save the air, this last um, air element for Hedwig, because we did have Hedwig die in flight um, during Harry trying to leave one of the safe houses for another. Um, in the book or in the movies, I just wanted to let everyone know, in the movies, there's a really cute scene of Ginny and Harry kissing finally. So you're like, oh, they're together. Yay. Um, and it was one of the twins that noticed this kiss. Um, but in the books, it was Ron that walked in on him kissing and it was bad. <laughs> It was like really bad. He's like, you're kissing my sister. Oh my God. He almost killed him. <laughs> so, so a lot of little stuff happened, obviously, from beginning to end. But the Battle of Hogwarts is um, where everyone, good guys, bad guys, the kids on uh, that were fleeing their lives, everyone goes back to Hogwarts. Um, and this is where we see... All the kids that were hiding out in the dungeons, I believe, or they were in the room of requirement. They were somewhere and they still, the kids that were at the school were still fighting off all the bad guys. And they still kept the Dumbledore's army strong while Harry, Hermione, and Ron were on the run, which is really interesting that the kids, there was still fight left, um, mm -hmm. even though the kids weren't there. And um, they talk to McGonagall. She's like, all right, I know that you're here to do Dumbledore's work. I will set up the perimeter. And they set up the amazing fortress around the school um, to protect the students from all the Death Eaters. The Death Eaters are right outside the school. Um, Voldemort calls upon Harry. Harry. He's like, hey, Harry, I know you're there. In the books, he gives him like six hours but in the movies he only gives them one hour and he's like um you will meet me here at midnight come out don't fight otherwise i'll kill everyone um so that that gives harry a little bit of time to find rowena ravenclaw's daughter um helena really ravenclaw I, it's the daughter of ravenclaw basically oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and he's like hey i need your diadem and she's like i've 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 been told that before. <laughs> Tom Riddle did this. I'm not going to play into your thing. And he's like, no, I need to ruin it. I need to kill it. And that's when she tells him, like, it's in the room of requirement through the riddle. And, of course, the truth has to be told in riddles. And that's, like, the biggest thing with a cult is if you get the riddle, you'll understand the truth. And that's why everything has to be told in child stories. Um, you have to share it in riddles safe enough to share so the bad guys won't understand what you're talking about. And if he was bad, he wouldn't have understood the riddle. So uh, Harry goes to the room of requirement. He grabs the um, diadem. But in doing so, he encounters Malfoy. Malfoy, it's so interesting because Malfoy could have killed him, but he didn't. Um, and they ultimately, he ends up saving Malfoy's life in trying to get this uh, diadem. And one of Malfoy's bros dies in the process. Like, it's a really horrible scene. And while he's doing that, Ron and Hermione know they have to kill um, Nagini. Because Nagini herself, they know, is a horcrux. So they have to go down to the Chamber of Secrets, grab one of the Basculus fangs, and kill or use the sword to kill um, Nagini. And that's a scary one to kill. Like that's. Whew, I can't believe they did it. But they did it. And they, they confess each other's love. And they end up being together. Which I'm sorry. <laughs> that's a trauma bonded relationship. Out of all trauma bonded relationships. Ron and Hermione. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I was almost like listening to you guys at your Halloween party a little bit like we're naked at the Halloween party and that was what we had to do with <laughs> yeah we didn't have any trauma that we bonded over we were just like oh I can deal with this for life <laughs> uh, I love your list 
mother lover snape that's another trauma bond <laughs> yeah so the cool thing about um the battle of hogwarts is the ki- first of all the kids get to fight back which i love like in love. real life i would love nothing more than yep. the kids somehow to bring down like hunter biden or like the kids take out like one of these horrible people like that would make me so happy if a child gets like the final <laughs> sword in because yeah you did have kids fighting um all these dark people and then the moms the moms came in clutch out of everyone because you see Mrs. Weasley. And last episode, we spoke about Mrs. Weasley. Her biggest fear is losing her children, obviously. And she does lose one of her children in the Battle of Hogwarts. Um, they don't show it in the movies. Um, I think this is really sad that they didn't show it in the movies. But when we lose one of the twins, I think it's Fred. Is it Fred that dies? I'm not sure which one of them. Okay. I can't remember. Um, when we lose one of the twins, actually what happened was Percy, her son that disowned her and like joined the ministry, Percy comes back and he's like, I'm so sorry. And we get a reunion of Percy into the Weasley family and he starts Ooh. fighting against the bad guys and Percy and Fred, let me see which one dies. Hold on. <laughs> Weasley twin dies. Uh, Fred is the only one who dies. So Fred and Percy are laughing and they're having a good time. And, um, Fred is killed. And then Percy just goes off and he's like screaming that Fred died and like everyone's there to see it. So it's a really hard moment because you, you gain back a child, you gain back Percy and he's rejoined and he starts laughing with the boys during this huge fight scene. And then, you know, he was in a cadaverous him from the other room, just like that. Exactly. So you get the mom's biggest fear. She does lose one of her children, but it's that anger that makes her, that allows her to kill Bellatrix Lestrange, which is one of the most powerful dark wizard, which is that we know. So it was the mom's anger and fury that allowed her to be able to Avada Kedavra, literally that bitch. <laughs> um, Bellatrix was, was like, I would say Bell- Bellatrix was probably the closest thing that Voldemort had to like a consort in this yeah. whole thing, yeah. as far as like a female mm-hmm. concubine <laughs> or something like that. And he showed her no love. He was all about Nagini. He yeah. was like, yeah. nah, me and my snake are, you know, yeah, exactly. I, I, Bellatrix was a real piece of work. She, the actress that played her, was like, I mean, they couldn't have done but better with than uh, Helena. Uh, Helena Bone Carter. Um, she, I, I think everyone was a little tired at that point in 2007, 2008 of seeing Helena in just another movie. Like, oh my god, because she, they really like <laughs> overdid her. But no, that was no one else could have been. Bellatrix she did an amazing job um yeah yeah, she really she she really did a good job on that um and then you see Tonks Tonks they don't really cover too too much in the book but she is pregnant and her and Lupin just got married and she goes to save Lupin and both her and Lupin are killed and they were going to adopt Harry which he's an adult you can't adopt him at 17 he's he's a grown man um but it is, you know, it is really, really sad. And we do find out she was carrying a baby. So she was a mother. Oh um, and then uh, Narcissa, it's really crazy that um, Narcissa, I mean, she's a Malfoy. She's one of the most deadly like rivalries we've ever had. But Harry saved Malfoy, her baby. And Narcissa has seen Voldemort just tear apart their family. The Malfoy Manor. We see um, Lucius Malfoy just be half a quarter of a man he used to be. Um, they've ruined the family, basically. And Narcissa knows that Harry, um, after the dream, which I want Jenny to go into a little bit more, which we covered at King's Cross, there's a part where it's up to Narcissa to either tell Voldemort that Harry's alive or Harry's dead. And Narcissa lies because. Um, she, she's over it. She's over it. So it was 
the worst family saved Harry Potter. And um, of course, Snape, this entire time, we haven't really talked about Snape, but um, he really comes in clutch at the very end. He is the ultimate, like, I don't know, not a, he's not a double agent. He's a triple agent. Um, and he pretended to be on Voldemort's good side up until the very end. And he gives Harry everything he needs to finish everything. And Voldemort kills Snape. And um, for the wand, which was in itself not the right thing because Snape wasn't the one to disarm Dumbledore of the Elder Wand. It was actually... Malfoy who did it so killing Snape was kind of not needed but Voldemort thought it was because he thought that's the only way to get the Elder Wand um, and we learned that Snape loved Harry like Snape loved his mother Snape ultimately gave his life to protect Harry um, all the people that we hated most your our biggest enemies throughout the entire Harry Potter series at the very end ended up saving harry potter um <laughs> and it's just like it's heart-wrenching and yet it fits it totally fits it totally yeah. fits um what else so happens fight back and make sure those school systems are not getting in the way thank you thank parents you. rights we have to do this in real time we have to fight the schools to get our kids it's just ridiculous to even say that but my best friend her kid and this happened to me too this was so triggering in fifth grade this really happened to me um i was in like a uh gifted class like all the smartest kids were put into this gifted program and we were put in so many different like school field trips. I don't remember any of the field trips, but every month we were on field trips. Um, it was like the freaking magic school bus. <laughs> and yeah. basically I was given like F's or like C's and D's all year, but I was always an honor student up until then. And my fifth grade teacher hated me. I don't know why, but she hated me and I was getting C's and D's. She got knocked up. So she went on maternity leave my last two. So we the last two months of my fifth grade year, we had a sub a long-term substitute teacher, and she was amazing. And this substitute teacher um ended up realizing that I was getting a hundred percent on like any project or test or whatever I did. And she's like, how are you getting 100% and all year you have like C's and D's? So this substitute teacher went through my year's worth of homework and projects and they were all A's and B's. And she's like, your teacher who's on maternity leave was giving your daughter, like it turned into this whole thing. My parents were brought in. They were like, um, we have to change her grades. She's actually an A and B student and... I don't know why, but all of her stuff has been entered wrong. And my friend just told me her kid in fifth grade, a student is getting all these C's and D's. And it's been like eight or nine times that this teacher has put in the wrong grades. And her son came to her and is like, hey, mom, this is what's happening. So the mom called the school and the teacher was like, um, we're trying to have kids sort this out on their own. So next time, stay out of the stay out of your son's um, work and have him come to me. And my yeah. friends like, excuse me for, like, I went to public school. So like for me, it's the public school system, but like my friend is paying a thousand dollars a month, if not more for her kid to go to this public, this like Christian school. So it's like, Oh, you're doing the same thing. Like this is how they get the gifted kids that they don't want to be in their club and they lie about their grades. And it's like, it's a, it's a whole thing and they're still doing it. They did it when I was a kid and they're doing it to my friend's kids. And I'm like, you have to protect the babies. This is legit warfare right now. So oh, it makes me so mad. Every time um, my kid walks through the front door, we do like a mini group program. Like as she can read, she can write. She knows she likes her uh, microbiology is her favorite. She knows social studies is a lie. She's like, yeah, she's like, she takes the test She because she knows it's all memorization, yeah, but she's, yeah. you know, she's more interested in learning about old civilizations and old languages and stuff. So I got really lucky with that one. My teenage boys, they never cared. They're like, yeah, we like, 
they just they're like whatever it we don't care <laughs> so like, All right. it's mommy's um, little girl ungroomable. ungroomable like i think it really has to do with like like in imbuing within your kids like a strong sense of self and when so because when you have an individuality you realize okay people outside of me can can throw whatever they want at me we got to, you know, like compare all of this external information with your inner knowing. And, and if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm like the easiest mom on planet earth. And the kids are like, oh, I got in trouble or like there was this thing, or I said something I wasn't supposed to. I'm like, you know, you know what you're supposed to do. You know, you know, the difference between right and wrong. You respect adults, not because they're your elders, but because we have basic respect for people. We're decent people. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like the way that they try to discipline these kids and the way that they just reinforce the idea of do what I tell you to do because I told you to do it. I'm team kids all the way. Like I'll never take a teacher's side over. My no. And what's no. funny is they assume a lot of these progressive teachers assume that the parents are so that everybody is liberal these days that they assume that they're going to take the par the teacher side like honey no like <laughs> you think i'm going to side with you against my child like you're smoking crack so a lot of these people are smoking crack uh in the public school system probably like maybe not literally but probably some you're like no they really are they really <laughs> are um and I mean, look it up, whatever state you are in, <laughs> look it up, <laughs> every, look up the fentanyl going through schools, which is, oh, yeah. yeah, real drug yeah, yeah, yeah. school system. Yeah. And also look up whatever county you're in and go Maricopa County sex offender teachers. Ooh, and it's all wow. these women, women teachers having sex with these kids. And it's like, I'm sure there's men too, but it's like mostly women. It's really, really gross. Mm -hmm. Um, they are predators. It's disgusting. We need to stop funding these schools and it yeah. takes everyone like everyone needs to stay home. And that's why they made women's <laughs> women go to work. Be a girl yeah. boss, bitch. Leave your kids with the school. You do you boo. <laughs> and it's like that's this evil matriarchy that is taking the not divine feminine of mm -hmm. trying to separate mama bear from her cubs so that mm -hmm. someone else can touch your cubs or play with your cubs. And I mean, looking back, my parents just, they were like, Oh, you got to see on that project. They didn't even think to like check the, if I was right or not, they just took it for the word. Like I understand who wouldn't. And my best friend, amazing mom, she, she doesn't know if the kid actually got a C or not, she's like, oh, I guess he's having trouble this year. Like the way they do this to hoodwink the parents and lie and do stuff to our kids is ridiculous. And it's not, not okay. Yeah. What time is it here? It's 1.15. Okay, really quick. Let's uh, wrap this up. I'll show my last couple slides. It's really just going to be a wrap up, which I love because, and I know I talked about this earlier in the series, but um, if you do watch Harry Potter, the seventh part two movie, um, hold on here. One moment. Um, if you watch the Hogwarts, the battle of Hogwarts, you see the, it's a 30 second clip. The kids are running across the courtyard. They dodge a troll attack. They dodge a big spider, which we see the troll in the first book. We see spiders in the second book. They dodge a dementor or a werewolf, which we see in the third book, a dementor from what we see in the fourth book. And literally every trial that the kids have gone through in the past seven years, in a quick blink of an eye, they easily get past in going through the courtyard scene it gives me shivers i'm like oh my gosh everything that we've gone through the people who have hurt us on this route the things we have learned that other people like didn't have to go through thank god we know how to easily fight them and that's that is ultimately ultimately mastership and what we can all say oh my god he's a freemason oh my god they look into the occult 
all the Masonic thing is, is to become a master of your craft. And that's why they try and make it seem so bad. And I'm sure, like we said, how the school system, how education itself has been taken over and corrupted. They don't want us to be masters. They don't want us to master of craft. Of course, it's been corrupted. Of course, the schools have been taken over. So that is what ultimately seven means. That's what masons are doing. They are becoming masters. And I always tell people, um, if you are familiar with the Masonic symbol, it is a... Okay, so the secret inspiration for the Deathly Harry Potter Deathly Hollow symbol. Um, J.K. Rowling like was like, oh my gosh, it really is like the Masonic. Uh, oh, look at that! What look a coincidence! That. What a coincidence! Oh, I didn't notice that. And like she herself has said, yeah, it's very similar to the Masonic logo. But if you ask, you can kind of tell what degree a Mason is based off of what they think this G represents. And if you ask a Mason under 13 degrees York or 32 degrees um, Scottish right, they're going to tell you that the G means gnosis. You have to know everything. And that's why so many in our community are so obsessed with knowing everything. But what I find happens when you know everything is like, analysis by uh paralysis by analysis and people overthink everything and they keep processing because they know too much that they don't know what to do with all this knowledge but if you ask someone who's 33 degrees or 13 degrees they're going to tell you that g means genesis it doesn't matter what you know it matters what you're willing to do what you're willing to create what does genesis mean Genesis means creation. The first book of the Bible or Talmud or whatever is Genesis in creation. So what is being a master? It means you're creating. It's You're not learning. You're not in school anymore. You're not, Sorry, Hermione. It doesn't matter what all these people did. It's what you're willing to do now. So becoming a master is becoming a generator. And you are like, you're, you're, you're creating. You go from knowing others' creations to creating yourself and um that is the g inside of the masonic symbol um and then what else did i want to go into hold on um the next series we're really going to be covering these orion wars and i just bring it up here really quickly because if we're talking about merlin and a lot of these origin stories um it would be who of everyone to check out the Orion Wars, which is a reptilian Draco war that has been going on for millions of years. And the idea is it has finally come to Earth. And this is where this Draco reptilian um, fight is when we talk about like our wars and the artifacts that Harry was looking for and that uh, Voldemort had um, corrupted <laughs> are the same things that Hitler was looking for. Hitler himself was looking for a jewelry piece and a sword and a resurrection. The uh, what is it called? Well, I was hallucinating earlier when I saw Hitler's that whole motif flash yeah. on the screen. I was like, oh. There's Hitler. <laughs> There's Hitler. <laughs> he was he was the there. Like I was like, wait, did I just see like a whole like popping? Yes, um, no, so Rise cool. TV. It was I. <laughs> you'll always be edge of wonder to me, but right. <laughs> <laughs> you can try to change, yeah. but you won't. Okay, so yeah, basically, it's a really good series. It explains that literally, Hitler had the same artifacts that Voldemort was kind of making into things. If you're interested in the Tiamat. Genesis uh, origin story and Marduk and basically why we have the uh, um, asteroid belt. Is that even the right name? The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Mars and Saturn? Right. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, it's called the Enuma Elish. And it's very well needed to understand anything about these ancient Sumerian, ancient Babylonian origin stories. It keeps coming up over and over again. There's something to it. Um, what else did I want to 
cover. Okay. So yeah, these are the people we see die in this one. Fred Weasley, one of the graybacks. Oh, Luce, um, Lupin and his wife Tonks. Mad Eye Moody. I always call Moody the Odin character. He is going yeah. to be one-eyed. He is going to be the number one protector. He is going to be have a magical eye that can see all. He is going to be the one who took down all the baddest people. Um, Hedwig, we did lose Hedwig, which really is Harry losing his innocence. She was yeah. his childhood protector and um, up in the movie, she's flying freely trying to protect Harry in the book. She's actually caged and he's trying to protect her and she ends up dying. It's really sad. Oh, Snape, no. I know. That's even That's worse. In dark. That's like so terrible. I can't it's bad. Die. It's bad. Um, Snape dies, which I mean, he could have, there's no way Snape would have been able to live. Like it's probably best that he died because no one's going to understand that he was a triple agent. He did right. kill Dumbledore. Like there's so much to it that he had to die. I honestly. To um, and then Nagini dies. <laughs> What else? Gray back is my like yeah. baby daddy for real. Like, Seriously? <laughs> no. Dated an asshole? No, just it, like. I mean, he wasn't, but no, like it's just kind of a joke because he's literally the worst <laughs> character. Yeah. And I'm just like, every time I see him, I'm a little bit attracted to him. I think because he's just like, he's literally the epitome of like the worst. So you wow. guys know, like, there's an allure there. I think that there's actually something to it. We yeah. try, we were like drawn to things that like heal us where we're most hurt, like or they trigger things where yeah. we're most hurt. So sometimes that can feel a lot like attraction, but really it's more like, oh, that's where you need to heal yourself. <laughs> so yeah, that type of person, even if it, and that's what a lot of people. Since I do a lot of healing, that's what people don't realize is. It might, yeah, whatever right, hurt right. you might not even be yours. And my best girlfriend, um, I'm just dragging all my friends. My best girlfriend has this like love for a certain type of guy. And we're like, dude, like you're stop dating these type of people. But she's like, no, you don't understand. It's like my, my grandma dated these type of people. And then I got to know her grandma and it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> you are your grandma. It's like, ancestral for some families that are drawn to these type of characters and this is just something that i think we might be attracted to but realistically it might have been like an aunt or grandma hundreds of years ago that was kind of hurt by these people and we're still carrying it around so a lot of what um triggers us might not be your shit quite literally it might be ancestral I'm going to use that as an excuse next time I'm caught slipping, checking out a Fenrir gray back, and I'm like, ooh, I can fix him. No, no you can't, no, honey. No. I'll suck you dry. Oh, <laughs> spit out your bones. That's so <laughs> funny. Okay, so a wrap-up of Harry Potter in real life, the Testament of Solomon. That who controls the pentagram ring controls the demons. And remember, each demon has an angel that can defeat it. So... Good to know whoever has the pentagram has control of the, the demons. Technically, if a good guy has control of the pentagram ring, um, the demons won't be too... Technically, demons could work for the good guy um, if, if someone has the control. The Scottish right to, to the throne. Queen Mary had her child stolen to get rid of Catholicism the way it was, and the baby was King James, and that King James baby was stolen from his rightful mother and was made to rewrite the Bible with a lot of missing stuff and a lot of different interpretations. This is something just to know whenever we're dealing with um, Scottish rites, which uh, Hogwarts is in the Scottish Highlands, and Merlin comes up a lot, which is going to be this ancient magic of that area. There's a lot of people who think that I think Israel is in America, but there's a lot of people think that think uh, Scottish Scotland is the real Israel. So it's just interesting. Um, the gunpowder plot. The gunpowder plot was a group of individuals in the 1500s, 1600s, who knew that the Scottish uh rightful heir was taken from the rightful family and they wanted at the time to remember 
remember the 5th of November. And everyone knows of Guy Fox of this mask. He has come up a lot in recent years as well. Um, anonymous is how we first kind of heard about WikiLeaks. And do not confuse WikiLeaks for QPost. Do not confuse Anonymous for Julian Assange. There are a lot of things going on that are kind of talking about the same things. But um, basically, WikiLeaks is a provable document that once we see emails, we know it will be true. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the QPost are true, even though I genuinely believe the first 100, 400 QPosts are real and that the last 3,000 are not necessarily what we think they are. Anyway, um, so <laughs> the gunpowder plot. You're allowed to talk about that now, but you're not allowed to say the F word on what YouTube. What's the F word? You can say like, you can talk about Q, but you can't say the F word. It's like the algorithm will like trigger on a different term now. I just heard yesterday that that might have happened, like that changed. If I said it, I'll go and bleep myself out from saying it. The F word? Well, I oh, I don't like care. <laughs> what was that? I'm sorry. I said it like 10 times. Is this going <laughs> on YouTube or is this going on like Rumble? On mine, it goes on Rumble, but I still try and make it YouTube friendly for Alexis. I see. Whatever. Yeah. It's fine. It's, I it. just thought it was I'm funny. I'm sorry. You can, funny. can you edit it out? I will. That's can what I'm know? I'm reminding myself to take it out in post edit. Okay. So, um, and we see Fox come up in Harry Potter. He is the Phoenix. Um, and the Phoenix symbolism for these occult society societies is interesting. It's basically the idea that an idea cannot be killed. An idea can be shared as a child story and it will keep coming up. So V for Vendetta is a modern take on the gunpowder plot and Guy Fox. What I think is really interesting to this day, Parliament actually closes down for the 4th of November and Parliament actually searches the tunnels that are under Parliament to make sure that there's no firework, like that there's no explosives. Um, if you look it up, you will see this. The day It's not always the 4th. It's the day before Parliament opens, which does change. Like if it's on the weekend, it obviously changes date. But the day before Parliament opens, yes, they to this day... Um, make sure that there's no bombs anywhere because of this little fictional story. So Search weird. the skies if you must, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's, good. That's funny. <sighs> staircase in degrees. Scottish Rite has thir 33 staircases steps. York has 13. Good to know because of democracy. Um, the one is clearly able to be more infected than the other because York, you don't have to like do time and grade for each, like each step. You kind of just like have a vote like, oh, um, Hunter Biden, let's just say if he was part, if he was part of this York system, uh, his daddy's famous and has paid us all to vote for, to vote you in. So you quickly gain rank not based on talent not based on actually knowing the steps but just based on democracy which we know when we hear democracy it can be taken over by fake votes and one is obviously because of that reason able to be taken over whereas whenever you have an apprenticeship in apprentice systems um benjamin franklin warned us that like people tend to put their apprentice more as a slave and have them work a little bit too long. So there are pros and cons of each type of learning through the Masonic uh, hierarchy. And yes, spiders are surveillance systems in real life, which I think is hilarious because when you do what I do and you talk about the spiders, someone someone always goes, oh my God, you can see them too. And it's like, yeah, I can't see them. I can feel them. I have a friend that can see them. But yes, uh, if you ever see one of these spiders, you can just say, I do not condone being surveil being under surveillance and they will go away. Um, most people don't know that they are there, but I think it's so funny because in the very first Harry Potter, like the very first 
scene. The reason that Dumbledore knew the Dursleys had Harry under the closet was because, and they say, the only thing in the closet was spiders with Harry under the staircase. And that they were the ones who were telling Boulder, or Dumbledore, yeah, he's under the staircase. They're treating him like a slave um, because they're surveillance systems. So good to know. Find me on rickyleaks.com, Telegram, uh, Ricky Leaks Beyond the Biohacking True Social. That's where I'm at. The girls are still very lucky and allowed to be on <laughs> Facebook, uh, YouTube, Ascension Diaries, and um, Jenny Constantine. Go check her out. Apparently, Russia is. so. <laughs> oh, that was, that was like the highlight. Of, that made my life, really. I was just like, oh, yeah, baby. That's so funny. I talk shit about all the characters here and I just kept adding to it. So if you want to pause on the screen, oh, go really ahead. Cool. Yeah. 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 I'm basically oh, just saying like what they are. Harry's a Leo. Hermione is Virgo. Ron is a Pisces. Uh, Ginny, Leo, Neville. Same as Harry. Just to your point about the spiders, I think that there's like, because there's astral parasitic-esque spiders yes. that run that sort of surveillance surveillance operations and they look similar to spiders in the sense that they're like spindly and they have a spider sort of form that form is like it, it's constructed that way because it, they're performing a function but then natural like earth spiders they're representative almost of like the exact opposite type of intelligence so like the astral spiders are here to surveil uh, for you know various purposes and feed that information back to that synthetic hive mind whereas the natural spiders of the earth they represent a natural sort of divine intelligence of the mother of our origins and i think they too you know i've been saying this for years my my husband my ex-husband we're still technically married but we're not together yeah. but he bought me a, a book on magical housekeeping for my birthday one year and I'll never ever forget what the book taught me about the arachnid kingdom and the number eight being a, a development if you will of the numerological um, sort of journey eight being about establishment also is about um intelligence there's a major intelligence there's also like honor there strength wisdom with the eights um, but the idea is that if the, you find a spider in your home, this is the magical housekeeping part of it, you save it, you rescue it, and you take it outside. You're then granted these, not wishes, but they're questions. And so you can interface with the organic, like the natural arachnid kingdom mm -hmm. and ask questions. It could be about anything, as long as you didn't ex um, assign too specific an expectation to what the answer was going to be or what that would look like. But the idea is that there are, you know, earth spiders are actually in alliance with, with humans uh, story here because we're part of the same mother, like we're related in that way with these surveillance spiders, which are an entire, which I don't even like to call them spiders because they're not spiders. They're not they're even spiders. They, they kind of look like it, but they're shown on the matrix when, yeah. um, the thing. batteries that hold the humans. There's these like spiders yes, that go all around. Yeah, and you do see them, and they're they have a counterpoint. And I hate when people go, "Oh, it's just astral parasites. It's not real." I'm like, they have an actual yeah, yeah. physical counterpoint. Like they have a counterpart, which is why Neo has yeah. to remove his metal yeah. stomach bug to get rid of the real astral spiders in his matrix he still has to get rid of the counterpart so um there's a lot of people who think they're just astral no they have a counterpart which is in your intestines and it is metal um which is why we talk about heavy heavy metal parasite cleanses um and uh, your gifts become a lot stronger the more and more you cleanse um also there's a lot of um the way we talk about crossroads and having different choices at every major decision in your life. A lot of people see the crossroads as a spider web and each 
each little thread of the spider web is a different way you could go down at each moment of life. So a lot of people think asking the spiders for help is like, which way can I go? And it's very similar to the Hakate asking which directions everything is. So I've heard that as well in the occult. So oh, thank you girls so much. I think we are done with the Harry Potter. We're done. We're done doing it. <laughs> As, no, like, but so that's we've covered a lot. This has been like, yeah. this is the this is the last time we're like closing up a Harry Potter episode. Yeah. I know. On to Star Wars, and I mean, there's so many different. I would love to do, and I have done it. I just, I've learned so much since that I want to refilm it. But I've done Transformers, the Transformers episodes. Those are crazy. You have the Fallen Angels and the Watchers, and uh, that goes crazy. The Power Rangers goes crazy. Um, oh, I love the Power freaking Rangers. The I'm the yellow one. I'm for sure the yellow one. <laughs> what, who are you? You're the Pink Ranger, Alexis. You're the Pink Ranger. Pterodactyl Power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do it. I'm sorry. I Go, 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 go. Dude, how hard did you use to break it down to the, like the intro and outro music? Like, that I was like, that was when I was sure that I was going to be part of the plan to help save humanity. Was when that intro and outro came on. I was like, fuck you. Sorry. Oh, and yes. when you edit this, can you make mine a dog bark? Yes. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. That's crazy that you say that too, because I have a home video where I'm like four years old and my mom made me a Power Rangers dress and it's, it's weird. It's, um, blockbuster video. You bring your kids of into course. blockbuster video yeah. and it was a video that if your child goes missing, show oh. this video to the police and we'll be able to find your child. And they ask the child questions. Yeah. Weird. And it's me fighting and I'm like in a Power Ranger skirt and like they can't, they're like, stay still, look at the camera. And I'm just like explaining a Power Rangers episode and I'm like, go, go Power Rangers. And I was thinking of that the whole time doing this. I was like, oh my God, I wonder what happened to that video. But yeah, it's funny. They did the same thing to me in a Blockbuster video. My mom picked me up from school. We went straight to Blockbuster Video, still in my uniform. They had me hold a sign. Mm -hmm. They asked me a series of questions. And they asked me what my favorite movie was. And I didn't know what to say. So I looked at the nearest, like, display. And it was Free Willy. And I was like, I guess it's Free Willy. <laughs> I love Free Willy. Oh, my God. That's but hilarious. We all had to record the same if we go missing video as, like, third grader or second grader. What did they yeah. really do with that video? I know it's, yeah. it's scary, yeah. but we've done a lot of videos on Harry Potter and it means we care very much about Harry Potter and the impact that it had on us. The impact is having on people now continually watching. There is physical locations where you can go engorge yourself with Harry Potter paraphernalia and all those things that you want. <laughs> and they're moving the steam engine along despite the Amish thinking it's not a good idea and pushing into a week or what was it? They're releasing more like stuff. They're going to be doing a TV series. So this is a different approach. But the concern I think that was brought up here was establishments that deal with children don't always have the best intentions or history or blah, blah, blah. And that the children themselves and the mothers who are involved have to come back and like basically reassign these realities of like how children are going to grow and learn and become masters in this life and like the relevancy of this pressure of the good and evil targeting children and even the potential that you would be born with some sort of karmic tie that you have to clear and but it was not any fault of your own in a way like you something bad happens to you and then you live your life dealing with that situation and maybe trying to correct it for society and i think that's a, a that was probably the biggest inspiration with harry potter was like the bravery and determination that he took on what the circumstances were turning out to be yeah. after he had to basically drag it out of the adults around him that were trying to hide his own reality from him while he's suffering the consequences the whole time. So when in this video is amazing because he's finally in his power. He's finally like with his army. He's not even dealing with school. He's on his own schedule. 
and Mm -hmm. applying things without the constant, like, I would say even the oversight of the, the professors and so on, which also had triple agent status. Like a lot of them were, uh, and how is that compared to now? And is there really much of a difference to what we're dealing with now in the schools? And are we all to rise up against the administrative uh, education, the administration of the education system and continue exposing it for being this, what's this word, like a front? Mm -hmm. And taking away that front and getting back to the true, you know, true, authentic, natural learning process of children and how they engage with the elements and how they engage with adults as well. And how they engage with those who aren't as much being trained in maybe the shamanistic ways of things, dream walking and so on. Some kids go on other paths, like they need to be more, they need to worry about being the chief, like they're being raised to be that. And some kids have to worry about being the people who feed the village and farm the land and make sure that that's healthy. And it's interesting, like some of those aspects didn't even really come into the modern schooling. They tried through herbology and things like that. And, and, uh, even this maternal energy was kind of veiled almost through the whole series. I noticed because the mother was killed off. That was the big deal. Her energy was this like amorphic force of love that was carrying Harry through all of it. But the mother in a way she was kind of not, I would say maybe not represented maybe as much in another character that you could kind of anchor that energy to. Do you, did you get that too from anywhere with the exception of Mrs. Weasley and right. um, like maybe Professor McGonagall, there was right. no mother energy in this. There was no goddess. There was no, this felt very patriarchal, very uh, uh, monotheistic in a way. Like their their God still felt like a male God. Um, no, where was the mother? I hear you. Lily to me is like Magdalene. She is the Mary of this story. And right. uh, she lived in a skin, that old magic. Her name's also Lilith. Lily stands for something. So that's interesting and creepy. Um, right. I saw a really cute meme, whatever meme. And it's um, Mrs. Weasley, obviously watching over Harry. And for when the kids graduated high school, Miss Weasley got Ron this brand new watch for graduating. And she gives Harry a hand-me-down of the family because he never has hand-me-downs of family because he didn't have a mom. So it's basically Lily with Lily Potter with her hand over Fred going, I'll watch over your baby since you watched over mine. And it's like, Oh my God, like, it's just so sad. And like full circle all the way mothers coming in for mothers, even if they're not blood related. Also um, something we didn't cover and Luna explains it to Harry. It's when the kids are all alone and Luna's like, I would assume he wants you to feel alone because he doesn't want you to feel like you have a power behind you. And like I was kicked off of Facebook and Instagram. I can't even see people's like, I can't even like try to see it says log in. I can't even see anything. And it's like, you're alone. Like it makes you feel like you can't do anything if you don't have that community. So stay together as much as you can stay communicative. And um, yeah, they can't take us all. (laughs) Thank goodness for Rumble being able to absorb a, a quite a he- heavy hitters, I would say, in our community that had been kicked off of the, I want to say, sanitized versions of social media, which some we're still trying our best to kick and push forward. True social too. True social, yeah. True social. That's, and perhaps there will. That's the one thing about resurrection where part of me has been like, I believe there's potential that we're going to resurrect the original kind of purpose and the original AI sort of algorithmic stuff that kind of made these social medias successful in the beginning and brought us all in and kept us meeting each other and exchanging and creating groups and feeling creative. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a potential we can maybe re-revolutionize that or re what's the word rebirth that in our current situation, but I'm not sure how that's going to happen. I'm, I am curious. I mean, right now having these conversations, it's right. And like, just making that decision, like, Hey, you remember how well it used to work? Um, Okay. Let's just go back to that and let's give everybody a reset. Everybody 
got some shit out of their system. Now start again and see if you learned your lessons, like, and only just remove people who are just slanderously hateful. Yeah. And uh, that would make more sense. <laughs> For sure. Oh, well, Godspeed, you guys. I'm so Godspeed. proud of you guys for fighting the good fight and having these crazy conversations with me. Thank you. Adios. We'll see you in future videos. Thank you. Bye.